uh, red leather than I do. I just want to make sure. <laughs> I don't know. If you got some red leather, we, we might have to do a road trip to Milwaukee to see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> So our meeting is now streaming live. Wonderful. I'm excited to be back together again to see everyone. <laughs> we'll give people just a, a moment to um, log on and then I will begin the meeting. So happy Friday to everyone. It is a beautiful morning and a great day to have our second Governor's Advisory Council meeting. I'm Dawn Krim. I am the Secretary at the Department of Safety and Professional Services, and I also serve as your chair. So I'd like to welcome our council members, our guests, and our community members who are joining us via YouTube for this meeting of the Governor's Equity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Right now, we're going to go ahead and take roll call. I'll ask Sarah if we have quorum. Sarah? Yes, we have quorum. Great. Thank you very much. And I will turn it over to Larice, who will be supporting our meeting today with any announcements. Good morning. I just wanted to remind everyone that during the meeting, Please, um, if you have any questions to raise your hand, I will acknowledge you in the chat. Um, please keep your microphones on mute if you are not speaking during the meeting as to relieve um, any background noise um, during our presentations. During our presentations today, um, all of our presenters will present their information and we will have a uh, question and answers following the presentations. At that time, um, Secretary Krim will call on you to respond or to ask any questions that you have. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, I have one more. We have one more announcement. I was, I want to announce and recognize the accomplishment of our secretary. Um, and Chairwoman. Um, Secretary Krim, we just want to congratulate you on your professional and academic achievement this past week and to congratulate you and let you know how very proud we all are of you and what you do. Well, thank you very much. And I would just say there's many others like me. I'm joining you all's ranks, but I do appreciate that acknowledgement. It's been quite a five years <laughs> working full-time, three jobs in this five years, taking classes throughout the summers as well. And I had two kids graduate high school <laughs> in that time. So more than a notion, but I'm excited. So thank you very much. Thank you. And so I'd like to go ahead and review our meeting agenda as well as move to approval of our minutes. But as a reminder, we will be following Robert Rules of Order. And so as an action item is listed on the agenda, what we'll do is we must take a vote. We'll make a motion by a raising of your hand. Larice will keep track of that and please state your name before you speak so we can attribute it who made the motion or second. So now we'll review the agenda and the meeting materials. Members should have received seven documents for this meeting. That would be the agenda, uh, the meeting PowerPoint, February minutes, uh, informational documents to how a bill becomes a law, the legislative process, as well as the budget process. And then lastly, the subcommittee assignments, roles, and responsibilities document. I know that's a lot of material. And then later on today, the governor and the lieutenant governor will be in attendance for the second part of the meeting, as noted on the agenda. So I will now accept a motion to approve the agenda. So moved, LeVar Charleston. And a second. Robin Day from Reese Summers. Second. Great, all in favor say aye. 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 Great. aye. 
and then I'll have another. Thank you. I'll have. Did you get the uh, the motion and the second? Yes, I have a motion from Great. LeBar and a second from Robin. Wonderful. And so you also received a draft of the February 19th meeting minutes. It was sent out about a month ago for your review and comment. If there are no further comments, I will now accept a motion to approve the February minutes. Secretary Krim, uh, Joaquin here, I, I move approval. Great, thank you. And a second? My Jean here, and I second. Thank you very much. All in favor, say aye. 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 Wonderful. Aye. Motion passes. So as you see, our meeting is scheduled from nine to noon today. I did put a break in there so we'll be able to stretch our legs and catch our breath and get a sip of water. Uh, but we do have an ambitious, ambitious agenda, and we have asked our uh, presenters to please stay within their time frame. And so with the important work that we have ahead of us, we want to advise you on how best to navigate change in state government. And so as we begin this morning's meeting, we're going to identify and deliver recommendations for promoting and advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion across state government. I want to make sure we have a shared understanding of Wisconsin state government. With that in mind, we'll use a portion of this meeting and future meetings to introduce you to various state agencies, programs, and operating systems. And so I understand the capacity building that will need to take place for each of us, because many of us, this is our first connection with state government. So we want to make sure that you have background information and reference materials that you can refer to, in addition to asking any questions that you may need along the way. And so first up, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. And she is Flora, Flora Santos, and she'll explain the gubernatorial board and commission appointments process. Flora is the director of gubernatorial appointments for the office of Governor Evers. And so she will now begin speaking. Thank you, Flora. Hello, thank you, Secretary. Good morning, everyone. It's really an honor to be here and I just want to thank Loris and her team for what I know is just a tremendous amount of organization that goes into uh, pulling this many folks together and I'm already really enjoying the energy that's here in this, uh, in this group. It's just a, a, a tremendous collection of folks uh, and thank you Secretary for your um, ongoing leadership, your partnership um, with our appointments process and just the changes you are bringing about in, in your work. It's really um, just an inspiration to watch. So thank you. As I'm, uh, I'll talk a little bit more broadly about the appointments process. Folks are welcome to navigate to our boards page. Um, if we could go to the next slide, it will show you how to get there. Uh, this is the governor's website. We're within the apply to serve tab, which is the top right tab. I didn't want to walk folks through this in real time. Technology glitches happen and whatnot. So if you would like to uh, look through this on your own, it's the bottom link there, boards and commissions. Um, and it will, uh, I'll be discussing some of that information. Uh, and I just want to share uh, within my time, this, this has been uh, uh, just watching our boards and commissions and task forces come to life. Uh, it's because of all of you. I'm in the very strange position of, uh, I think I know most of you, but you probably don't know me if you've gone through our appointments process. Uh, I've had a chance to work on your materials uh, and the work that my um, small and, and mighty team that we accomplish uh, within the governor's office is just something that's really exciting and that I want to uh, talk about as much as you all will let me. Uh, so first, I want to give you a sense of uh, the boards and commissions we do have. And I want to talk about this, especially in the context of this task force's work, because there are so many um, board members and other councils that you all can be reaching out to and partnering with, working with. Uh, some of them have been around through multiple administrations and have a historical understanding of 
um, of their board's mission and, and the work and how it's looked in different years. Uh, and some of them are very new. Uh, so there's a, a way to um, understand who's working on what and to bring that partnership about. I also received questions ahead of time about how we can, how this task force can support the governor's work in his appointments process. Um, and and um, how, uh, if there's ways that we can be especially collaborative. So I'll touch on that as well. Uh, and of course, talk specifically about some of the boards that we have. So next slide, please. Uh, I want to cover some of the boards that are in existence. This is just a small sample, uh, uh, but when you navigate to our boards and commissions page, um, and I want to shout out our IT folks, Ryan, I know you're listening and this could not have happened. Uh, this beautiful website could not have come to life without some um, true sweat and tears. Uh, and just uh, bringing all of our boards under one umbrella was really challenging in a way that um, we knew was important to have, to give all this information and power to constituents who are applying. We wanted to make it simple. Um, and so the way we've set it up uh, and I do want to read the, the welcome section at the top because it was something that we carefully considered in the appointments office. Um, but just the general setup, you'll see the name of the board is on the, in the left column. We've included the mission statement because it's not always obvious, of course, from the name of the board, what this board works on. And then we've categorized them by issue area uh, to make it easier for sorting. And those boards that do have uh, a website, I know you all do, for example, um, we've linked them to the name of the board. Uh, and again, this uh, is sort of in contrast to how it used to work. It was um, uh, not especially open or transparent to those applying. Uh, and something I've noticed in this niche world that I work in uh, is folks don't necessarily know that there are boards and commissions they can apply to. And of course, our, our step in bringing in new board members, um, those of different genders, races, ethnicities from different corners of the state, from different uh, lines of work, different ages. Uh, the governor wants to appoint all those folks. We want new voices in our councils. Uh, we are doing things differently. We're embarking on new, um, in addressing challenges that have, uh, in, in new ways. Uh, and so getting the word out will be the first step. And that's something I would love to have um, uh, partnership on and working with this task force, uh, just at least sharing this link. It's out there. Um, if you know folks who are at the start of their professional journey and would like to add something to their resume, uh, being a board member is something um, in my personal experience, the boards I've served on, really furthered uh, uh, my, my understanding of how uh, work is accomplished uh, within these boards. And we have about 200 of them. So there's no shortage of issue area to work on. Um, anything that you are passionate about, I promise you, the Evers administration has a board for you. Uh, and some of them uh, meet more often than others, of course. We have boards where we appoint um, one or two people. We have boards where we've created um, a task force all on its own and it's up to 30 people. So we really, each of our boards range in size. Um, they range in focus uh, and they really do range in, in uh, um, even in uh, term length. Some boards, you, we appoint folks for two years to serve. Um, others, it's up to a seven year uh, appointment term for the, the term length. Uh, and I do just want to say one big uh, piece that differentiates our boards, uh, and I know Secretary Krim is familiar with the DSPS boards. Uh, those who are appointed, um, constituents who are appointed, also go through the Senate confirmation process. And so um, it, it's um, about a third of our boards require Senate confirmation, which means the person introduces themselves to a committee of state senators um, talks about their interest in this board and then they answer any questions. Um, and so there's um, uh, different um, ways of being appointed as well. If we could navigate to the next page, please. Somehow I'm already halfway through my time, not surprising. Uh, this is the drop down menu for issue area. So if you're on the website, feel free to navigate through this as well. Um, we've created just bigger. Um, 
focuses so that folks can can sort by uh, what's of interest to them. Uh, this again is meant to make it simpler. Of course, you you can certainly scroll if you leave it on select all. You can scroll through everything that's there and go from there. Um, otherwise, if you click into one of these, it will show you uh, what uh, any uh, a board that you uh, might want to work on. If there's a specific uh, issue that you're interested in, uh, and I'll have us navigate back, navigate to the next slide, please, as well. Um, this is our application. It is um, being updated. I would like to see it uh, changed and and sort of. Um, moved into something simpler. You can see it's six pages. Um, we're, um, we're sort of, as we speak, it is undergoing changes. But for now, this is where folks navigate on our website um, to share their contact information, share um, a, a brief biography about themselves to, that we can take to the governor um, and any other materials that they might need for the board. Uh, this is also where you can select your top three boards. That's how we're approaching the appointment process at this point. We ask folks to, um, if, you know, if their top two boards are even not available, that there may be a third. So I will take the last few minutes to talk about the appointment process itself. If we could navigate backwards uh, to the slide that had, uh, the second slide that had all of our boards listed. Uh, part of the process um, is, yes, perfect, this slide, thank you. Uh, part of the process, once applicants have applied, which as I said, is sort of the first step and something we are, are trying to get the word out about a little further uh, in the administration. Uh, but once folks have applied, they choose top, their top three boards. And at that point, it's a, a very dynamic process. As you can imagine with thousands of seats that the governor has appointing authority to, uh, finding uh, the right fit at the right time when there is a vacancy uh, is, is, is one of the demanding parts of our office's job. Uh, and so if um, we ask that when folks apply that they list three because there may not be a vacancy, like I said, for seven years, if the term length is seven years, uh, there might be a, a similar board that the person didn't notice. We, uh, and because it is such a dynamic environment, we um, keep people's materials on hand. Once you apply, we, we keep it. We have folks who applied at the, you know, in 2019, who we are appointing to seats now. Um, and I have had the chance to make those exciting phone calls and sometimes folks forget they applied for a board, but we still have their information because if you are somebody who took the time to apply and we see a fit and you uh, represent this administration's values, uh, we want you to be part of this process. But again, it might just take years and timing can be tricky um, in, in this work. Uh, so once folks apply, it comes to us, those materials are saved. And even if you do not select a board that we know there is a fit for, um, we might approach you about that. We enjoy being proactive. It has brought some really exciting results where there are boards that um, are hurting for folks or um, are have a really um, prescriptive high, uh, a, a sort of high threshold of qualifications to meet, we might approach that person. Um, and folks can always contact us. I want to flag our email account, which is really the main uh, email shared inbox that my team and I work with. It's uh, listed there at the top, govappointments, G-O-V, appointments, plural, at wisconsin.gov. Uh, this is a... Folks can always reach out to ask about the status of their application. Again, uh, it, it changes from time to time. Uh, we do not post vacancies because those can change on a daily basis. We have folks who need to step down. We have folks, um, you know, a different timing of appointments. Uh, and so folks can always check in to ask about their, their boards um, or to send along a new resume. Maybe their position has changed or um, if, if their contact information has changed, we love to know that. Uh, and if you know folks who want to reach out to us, again, please feel free to share this website, share our email address, uh, because folks are really uh, welcome to contact us. We know it's a, a, a fast paced uh, uh, environment and we would love to hear from these folks. Uh, and before I 
close, I will just say uh, there are a number of councils that I see as directly supporting your task force's mission. I hope you'll look through this list. You are welcome to contact folks that uh, for any reason, they are, these are people we have the utmost confidence in who, um, who can be partners in this work, who can um, uh, lend their expertise. And it really is um, all hands on deck in terms of equity. It is all of our work. Uh, and if uh, one of our boards, if the appointments office can add its drops to the bucket, um, we stand at the ready to do so, absolutely. Uh, and so if there are boards you see here that you think, oh, they might be presenters, they might be um, folks who can share expertise uh, with their work on the, the Women's Council, on the Affirmative Action Council, the Board for Developmental Disabilities, are there folks who've worked on access in terms of um, different a government functions, anything, wherever this task force's work takes it, um, be assured that there are folks who are walking that walk with you, who um, as board members have been doing it, some of them for um, 20 years, 30 years. It's, um, they have a tremendous amount of expertise. Um, so I'm happy to uh, touch on questions um, whenever it works for the, for the office, uh, but I really want to uh, encourage folks to apply because there is a, um, we always welcome new names. Uh, and I just want to share the, um, the welcome that was crafted. Uh, thank you for your interest in public service. The administration of Governor Tony Evers and Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes is seeking the best talent to drive change and find solutions to the problems facing Wisconsin's residents. If you are willing to serve Wisconsin, come as you are. The state of Wisconsin is an equal opportunity employer committed to a diverse and talented workforce. Uh, so please come as you are, join the team or send someone who you know is interested in serving. We're really looking, we're already looking forward to talking to them. Thank you again, Loris, uh, and thank you, Secretary Grimm. Great, Flora, that was great. So I thank you for your, your presentation and we do have a moment or two for any questions that you all may have for Flora. You can type them into the chat or you can raise your hand and we will find you. And this will not be your only opportunity to ask questions. Again, if you put them in the chat, we will circle back and get back to you. My office has worked very closely with Flora since her arrival at uh, DSPS. We have over 100 councils, committees, and boards. And so we are a regular customer <laughs> of Flora's. And I thank many of you on the council who are already uh, members of some of the boards and commissions listed. We have one question in the chat, Madam Secretary. Yep, is, so I'll let you go ahead, Loris. Is there a report on the diversity of members of the boards and commissions? That's a good question. Um, when we have information about that an applicant has provided, it's of course optional. Um, to uh, provide either demographic information um, or uh, you know points of uh, of tracking that would be helpful. Um, I we were also tracking uh, at one point when we've um, uh, appointed someone from each county of the state, which we've reached at this point. That was. Um, a goal that the governor identified as important. And I would say board by board, it, it varies. I know, for example, um, one of our healthcare boards uh, reached out to us recently to share that it is now the, um, it's the most, their board is the most diverse it has ever been in its existence in terms of um, health care profession, in terms of age, um, in terms of the gender uh, balance on the board. And so I'd say it really, uh, it varies by board, which is usually the case in our work. Thank you. We have one final question. 
um, is there a way to learn about the term length and frequency of meetings for boards and commissions? That's a great question and something we debated putting on the website. Um, term length does not change. It usually can be found on the board's website. Uh, you can also reach out to us if you have top three or five uh, boards that you're interested in. Um, we, uh, and we can get you that information quickly. Um, in terms of uh, meeting frequency, occasionally that changes. And so we don't have it posted. Uh, but it's something our office can send to you because that is a main consideration is what is the time commitment if I'm going to serve on this board. Uh, and so we want folks to know that up front also. Thank you. We will follow up with further questions um, after the meeting. Thank you again. And I'll stay on. I know my colleague is presenting next uh, and I'm, uh, I will certainly be reachable. Thank you all. And thank you, Larice, for the invitation. Thank you for being here. John, you're muted. See, I was trying to make sure there was no feedback. So next up, we have T.R. Williams, and T.R. will give us an overview of how the Wisconsin state government works. T.R. is the Deputy Director of External Affairs for the Office of the Governor Evers, and this will be a lot of information because it takes a lot of work for state government to work. So T.R., over to you. Thank you so much, Secretary Krim. Thank you for having me. Welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so this is really just a level set. I recognize that all of the uh, members of the council may have different levels of um, working with government and knowing this, uh, but wanted to provide sort of a base for everyone. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. I have to always share that although I am an attorney, I am not your attorney. And so this presentation is only for general information. And if you have specific questions or legal advice, then you should certainly uh, seek out those. Next slide. So I like to start off just big picture what is policy? As we're talking about how government works and how policy uh, moves through the government system, I want to level set how I use the word policy in this presentation. Um, and I also think it's important to make it a little bit less um, sort of this big thing in the sky. Uh, so I define policy as a construct. It is something that is made in response to an issue or a problem that requires a solution. Policy is also what the government chooses to do, as in their actual action, or what they choose not to do, implied action, about this issue or problem. Policy uh, can take the form of law, regulation, a set of laws or regulations that then govern this issue or the problem that was the impetus of something being constructed to uh, address it or to resolve it. Um, and policy is an ongoing process that does not always have a clear beginning or end. That part for the lawyer and me is probably the most difficult uh, in the policy game uh, because there isn't a clear, uh, we have a trial, uh, there's contention, everyone makes their argument and then we're done. Um, there is a cyclical nature uh, to policy, which at its base is the way that our democratic process uh, should be able uh, to work. Next slide. So who makes policy? Uh, it includes the legislature, uh, not only at the state level when we refer to our assembly and our Senate here in the state of Wisconsin, but also other uh, local elected bodies. So a school board, um, county supervisors, city council, those are all a local elected bodies uh, that make policy. And obviously we know at the federal level, we have Congress also in that bifurcated system of our um, Senate and the House. Uh, the executive branch makes policy as well at the very local level. That could be a, a city administrator or a mayor at the state level. That's the governor at the federal level. That's the president. Uh, the executive branch of government will sign or veto bills. They will propose a budget. Uh, they will make appointments, as Flora gave an excellent presentation on. State of Wisconsin, though, it is important for me to note that out of the appointments that are made by the governor, the Department of Justice, so our Attorney General Josh Call, and the Department of Public Instruction, so our now uh, 
currently Superintendent Carolyn Sanford Taylor, but a newly elected superintendent um, with, that we just had a, a election for are all elected positions. Those are not appointed by the governor. Um, in the case of Superintendent Carolyn Sanford Taylor, there was an exception because the governor in becoming governor was leaving his role as superintendent. And as the governor, he had the option of holding a special election for the remainder of his term um, for superintendent or to just make an appointment. And he made the appointment of um, our current superintendent. So just an asterisk there on those appointments. Other uh, bodies that make policy, departments and agencies. Uh, when I give the, this presentation in the presence of uh, elected officials, legislators, they give me pushback about this. Uh, it's true though. Uh, departments and agencies do make policy in the sense of how they create and administer programs. Uh, so oftentimes uh, what agencies and departments give us pushback on is the executive branch and the legislative branch have thought through a problem, we grab a solution, and then we say, okay, departments and agencies make that solution happen. And so in their implementation of a program or a solution, there really are implementing policy and how they regulate what that looks like and how it's done, how they develop it. Um, oftentimes, agencies are also monitoring a program or a policy or an issue or a solution to a problem, evaluating it and studying it, which is really the impetus for that cyclical um, nature of policy. Uh, because in that evaluation, monitoring and studying of it, they may find that there are some other issues that need to be addressed. So I certainly put departments and agencies uh, into the policy making um, realm. And then there's the judiciary, the courts. Uh, sometimes that's a little bit less sexy when people think about policy, uh, but the way in which a judge, the bench, uh, interprets uh, legislative intent, or they hear and decide lawsuits, uh, create a legal precedent, which is a form of a policy. Uh, for example, um, recently, uh, as in this last year and a half, uh, when the Supreme Court was reviewing whether or not the governor or our, here, our, our head public official, public health official, meaning our secretary of DHS, were able to make certain orders doing a public health emergency, what defined a public health emergency, those decisions by the Supreme Court Court are going to live with the state of Wisconsin for forever. Uh, those decisions were specific to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but there are um, certainly principles and policy that will be used um, in the future. And so the judiciary or the bench judges are also part of that policy making. And then I always like to clarify when I put legislators as policymakers, what do they do? They pass legislation and resolutions. Resolutions are sort of intent of interest um, about a particular topic. And they also set and approve the budget. Uh, it doesn't happen with just the governor's office alone. And we'll actually take a time to talk more specifically about the budget process. Uh, legislator or legislature also will hold uh, hearings um, for fact finding, um, and they also respond to constituent issues. Next slide. This is just a list of all the Wisconsin state agencies uh, uh, for folks to know, and I put in the website there where you can go uh, to find those as well. Next slide. So this kind of just gives a visual representation of that ongoing cyclical process of policy that it really isn't linear with a clear beginning and end. Um, you know, I would note the first step would be identifying the problem. Um, sort of, you know, I, uh, the example I give is that I am an orange grower and we have a market for our oranges on Tuesday and Tuesday is really a bad day as an orange grower. I really need to have it on Friday. Um, it has to do with when my oranges are at their best. It has to do with traffic patterns. It has to do with what's best for my business as an orange grower. And so that's a problem and it's a problem for me, but I need to be able to go into the second step, which is raising the problem profile. If no one else knows it's a problem for me, but me and my business, I'm not going to be able to get to the point of doing anything about it. So in identifying the problem, that can be advocacy groups, that can be elected officials, that can be government agencies, uh, is ultimately why I have a role and a job for the governor's office as external affairs, is to be keened in onto community members and what's going on so that we can know what problems exist. Raising the problems profile is the same cast of characters that can be a part of doing that group or doing that work, advocacy groups, elected officials. Then it's developing a solution and getting it adopted. So in the example of the orange growers, I said, hey, Friday is really going to be the best day. The time that it takes for me to move my oranges from our farm to where it's going to be at, at the market is really optimal. And that's the day that I want to get it done. And so I just need to get 
uh, people around this idea. Maybe I've even gotten uh, folks who are part of the local market planning to also agree with this because Friday works well with them. And so now I have folks from different areas, not just orange growers that are behind my issue, which makes my issue have an even more, uh, a stronger sort of argument. And in developing a solution and getting it adopted, you also can have advocacy groups who are part of that, elected officials, government agencies, and community members. And then it's implementing the policy. Um, and agencies oftentimes, as I said earlier, are really a part of that, right? So how do we get from moving traffic, moving the market, uh, getting the permit, all of those details to make sure that now the orange growers market from Tuesday is going to happen on Friday. And then evaluating that impact. Um, and what really that means. And so what we didn't anticipate in moving the market to Friday is now for parents who have soccer practice on Friday, that's happening, you know, only a mile away, their traffic is messed up because of this. And so now there's another issue that has another um, uh, uh a potentially way in which we need to solve this problem that one issue, you know, didn't think about it or didn't realize that that would be one of those impacts. Uh, and then that's when we go back into the, the cycle of the policy process. Next slide. Uh, these are just some quick reference points that I like to share with people about how our government works. Uh, legis.wi.gov, L-E-G-I-S.wi.gov is a site that I stay on. Uh, there you can look up who your representatives are. You can look up what a current legislation is out there. You can look at what committees exist, what committees those legislations are a part of. It has tons of information. Um, for Wisconsin, we have 33 state senators who have four-year terms. We have 99 assembly state representatives who have two-year terms. Uh, so just to clarify, just like the federal government, Wisconsin has a bifurcated system. So our legislature is in two parts, the Senate, which is higher ranking, and the assembly. Uh, there are two uh, very powerful positions in the Assembly and the Senate. That's the Speaker of the Assembly, who is Robin Voss, and the leader of the Senate, Senate which is uh, Devin Lemahieu. Um, and those roles, they name all the committees. So committees are legislative bodies that are not part of a democratic process. Uh, they just exist by the um, direction of the leaders of both houses. And um, those committees are the first ones who will see certain pieces of legislation. Uh, the idea is that there's so much legislation that you're gonna get more effective work when you break it down. So the committee is the one who has sort of that first bet at a piece of legislation and they will make a recommendation to the full body of the assembly or the Senate based on the hearings they've had and the time they've had to debate that particular piece of legislation. So the speaker of the assembly and the leader of the house, they name all of those committees. So for instance, the last budget cycle, uh, Robin Voss created a Medicaid, I forgot the exact name of it, but it was a committee that had never existed, but that was in his power to do. Uh, those leaders also chooses which committees are going to exist and they decide who are the chairs and the members from their party who will be on that committee. Um, and I always mention this because as we talk about voting and electing folks, we never really think about the person that we could elect um, or if we choose not to vote, that person who ends up getting the job can also end up having a very strong leadership position uh, in the legislature, uh, making large decisions for the state, even though that's not what we um, necessarily elected them to do. Uh, in Wisconsin, we have the Joint Committee on Finance, which is always abbreviated JFC. I never know why that happened, but you'll see JFC, even though it's Joint Committee on Finance. And it's unique to Wisconsin because it combines budget and finance. In other states, those are separate, um, but it's together. And the reason why it has the joint in front of the committee is because it includes members of the Assembly and the Senate. Most committees have committees for the Senate and committees for the Assembly, but this one is joint. Uh, there's 16 members on that committee. Uh, you need nine affirmative votes or yes votes and for something to pass. This is especially um, critical right now because that's the committee that the budget goes through first before it goes to the full assembly and the full Senate. 
Uh, and just to level set again, when I use the language of bill, that's um, a language before something is signed. So that's a proposed solution to a problem. And act is the language that you use after something is signed. So that's the law in effect. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Legislative Reference Bureau. So they are actually the ones, mostly they're lawyers, they're nonpartisan. So it's not even that we have Republican and Democratic, but they have no political leaning. They are sort of the translators into how this solution for a problem is going to be put into legislative language. So they're the ones that actually write the bill language. Next slide. Uh, these are just some frequently used words and meanings. I want to give us time for questions, so I won't go through them at all, but that's for your edification so that you can uh, see those as well. Next slide. Uh, this is what I call my Schoolhouse Rocks remix of how a bill becomes a law. This is a very uh, quick version of it. Um, a bill ethic typically by the Legislative Reference Bureau, but it'll have the name of an assembly member or a Senate member on it, or both sometimes. The bill is assigned to either the Senate or the assembly based on the author. The bill is referred to a committee. Um, a hearing is held by that committee. A public hearing is held by the committee on the bill. The committee votes on that bill. That's called it an executive action that they take. That process is not um, public in the sense of uh, folks are not able to weigh in on that. Um, sometimes WISI may stream live for you to see that session, um, but that action is not uh, open to the public in that way. The bill is then scheduled for a vote on the floor in front of the full assembly or the full Senate. The vote is conducted on the floor, and then the bill is sent to the opposite legislative body to go through the same process, um, which is called concurrence. You can't have um, a bill, ha for instance, have an amendment in the assembly, but it doesn't have that same amendment in the Senate. Those bills have to look the same in both houses, so they go through both uh, processes um, the same. And this makes it look like it happens very quick but there are certainly a ways in which uh, this process can take a whole lot longer than what these steps may reflect. Next slide. So these, I'll just have us, uh, as I'm talking, I'll just have uh, our tech team continue to flip through the sides. This just gives a visual uh, for uh, folks who are different types of learners of that step one through eight that I just shared. So you can keep clicking through the deeper dive slides until we finish through. So this just goes through what I said about it being committed, uh, assigned to a committee once it's introduced, having the opportunity to have a joint, um, excuse me, a public hearing on it having the opportunity to make amendments on it. Again, it's important to know that those amendments happen uh, with the committee themselves or on the floor with the full body. They don't happen to the public. And those amendments uh, that are made don't come back to a public hearing so that the public can necessarily speak on those amendments. You can go through the next slide as well. You can keep going through. Um, and keep going through. This is just reflecting that same visual in the Senate, um, going through that same process there. I will pause on here and just say that finally, once it's gone through both processes, it stops at the governor. Um, if it's a bill without the signature, um, it needs to be signed or vetoed, taken action on within six days. Uh, then the Secretary of State will publish it uh, with the approval. The date that it was signed is the date that the law is enacted. Uh, the Secretary of State will then publish it one day after that sign, and that will be the date of when it's it's good law, um, unless the bill or the law itself has, like, this will be in effect in a year, unless they have a very specific um, number on it. Next slide. And so let me pause here, take the last few minutes that I have specifically on the biennial budget process, which we are currently in. Uh, so September 15th of an even year. So September 15th of 2020 is when all the state agencies submit a budget to the governor uh, via the state budget office, which is under the Department of Administration. Um, and they would have gotten um, instructions from the governor, guidelines from the governor. Every governor, every administration has the thing that makes their administration notable. Uh, this governor specifically uh, talked about infusing equity in all policies, which included 
the budget that each of the state agencies were going to submit to the governor. By November 20th of the even year, so November in 2020, uh, the DOA secretary will provide the governor or the governor-elect if we're in the election year, um, and each member of the, the legislature with the total amounts of each agency's biennial budget. So it doesn't go into the details, but it goes into what the big numbers are. And then the last Tuesday in January of the odd year, so January of 2021, is when the governor delivers the biennial budget message. Uh, in the case that we've had here and the last budget, the governor can request an extension from the legislature if need be. Uh, this was a COVID year. A lot was going on. The governor requested that extension, and we actually had that governor's address in February. In late February or early March of the odd year, so in 2021, it actually happened in April um, uh, this year, uh, the Joint Finance Committee, which is the committee that uh, deals with the budget first after it comes from the governor, will hold agency briefings. So they will basically ask agencies questions um, about their budget. Uh, those are open for the public to look at, but not to make commentary in. This year, the Joint Finance Committee uh, did uh, agency briefings for the Department of Workforce Development, the PSC, the Public Service Commission, Department of Public Instruction, and the Department of Natural Resources. Um, and then in mid, late to March or April, again, this happened actually in April, the Joint Finance Committee will hold a public hearing throughout the state on the budget. Um, and then April through June of the odd year, so currently where we're at now, is the Joint Finance Committee voting through all of the different pieces of the budget, and that work is called executive action. Next slide. Uh, then the Joint Finance is going to finish the budget work. Uh, they wrap it up. It's called a 999 motion. Uh, each House, the Assembly, and the Senate has to vote on the version of the Joint Finance Committee budget, so it would have changed uh, typically from what the governor did. Um, they can, the legislature, the Assembly, and the Senate can attempt to make amendments at that point. Uh, then there's a conference committee to make sure that each versions are the same, just like how any bill would happen. Um, and then the budget is sent to the governor. Uh, really, the governor calls for the budget is the better way to put it. Uh, and then if the governor uh, vetoes it. Um, it could possibly go back to the legislature for an override if there are enough votes in both houses. Next slide. Uh, this is just reminding folks that there are also fiscal bills, bills that spend money that are not the budget that we deal with throughout the year, but I wanted to focus on the budget side of things. And I think that's it, because I see it's 946 and I had to 945. Uh, we'll, we'll have to skip the advocacy spectrum piece uh, for now. <laughs> Great. TR, you did a fantastic job with that overview. And so what I'd like to do now is move to questions that people have. And I'll let Larice check uh, the hands and the chat and call on individuals or read their questions. And it looks like Joaquin has his hand up. Joaquin? Yeah, good morning. Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment to say how blessed we are to have TR. You know, Governor Evers did an amazing job at appointing her position. And I think this is the reason why this committee is so important because when we approach something through diversity, inclusivity, and equi equitableness, that means that language matters. And when TR spoke to me, I understood. I mean, even being in the position that I am, I learned even more today. And so, I really do appreciate you, TR, in, in the way you spoke, uh, because you and I come from the same fabric. And I think this is why, again, just the double underline why it's so important, the work that we do through this committee. So thank you, TR. My pleasure. Thanks, Joaquin. Great. Thank you, Joaquin. Other questions? Many are concurring in the chat that this presentation was great and really provided a lot of good knowledge and well presented. So TR, just the slides were easy to follow. The examples, the orange grower, uh, very visual examples that really helped people digest the information. Awesome, glad to hear it. Always glad to make policy accessible for folks. <laughs> Very informative, thank you. Again, thank you. Um, we all appreciate you, TR. Those are the comments that you're receiving. Um, great presentation, incredible talent in this room.
So what I'd like to do is if people have additional questions, uh, do put them in the chat and we will um, follow up with TR with any of those questions. And because Flora and TR presented the information in such a clear, precise way, uh, we are able to move to our break in advance of our time, which is wonderful. And so our break originally was scheduled for 10 to 10.10. 10. Because it is almost 9.50, we will break now and come back at 10 a.m. And so you have 11 minutes, thanks to TR. Uh, you have a little bit more time. And so now we will go ahead and pause for a break and we will return promptly at uh, 10 a.m. And we will provide both Flora's contact information and TR's contact information uh, in the chat so that people are able to reach out to them directly. So any questions you have, please put it in the chat. We'll follow up or you can follow up directly. So with that, we will move into a break and return promptly at 10 a.m. Thank you.
just want to welcome everybody back from break, giving people another few seconds to come back and get assembled. And so again, I want to thank Flora and TR for excellent presentations, remembering that the PowerPoint that you received as part of the meeting information has their slides for you to refer back to, as well as some of the materials that we've provided um, as part of the meeting today will also further inform your information about Wisconsin state government. And so I thank you all for returning back to the meeting promptly. If you look at your agenda, once again, we've, we're now moving to the session where we'll talk about uh, an Executive Order 59 update. We'll learn a little more about the Supplier Diversity Program. Uh, and then we will have agency overview updates, including their equity and inclusion updates from four of our secretaries. Uh, but before we do that, we will open this uh, segment up with Executive Order 59 overview. So I will now turn the meeting over to Malika Ivanko, our DPM administrator, to provide that overview for you. Hi there. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we yes. can. Yes, wonderful. All right. Yes. So Thank you. So I know that I have been working with you all on the council, um, but many of you may know my day-to-day -day work. Um, I oversee the human resources arm for the state of Wisconsin. So human resources includes like our classification and compensation, our training and development, our merit recruitment and selection. So all of our hiring processes and policies, our benefits and payroll administration, our equity and inclusion efforts, as well as our workforce relations. Um, we have a dynamic team of about 400 um, HR professionals, that's directors, supervisors, managers, all across the state. Um, and so I wanted just to take an opportunity. I know that you all are aware um, that the governor's um, EI council was crea created um, from executive order 59, um, but also just wanted to, uh, there's other things that are in the executive order and then provide an update and then turn it over um, to, to also provide other updates related to executive order 59. So if you can go to the next slide. I wanted to summarize, um, and many of you have seen the executive order, um, but in a nutshell, it um, establishes a statewide um, Governor's Advisory Council on, on Equity and Inclusion. And of course, I had to say that because that's what created this group, but I won't spend any time there. Um, it also expands the focus of our State Council on Affirmative Action. It requires that all cabinet secretaries attend a diversity, equity, and inclusion related training on an annual basis. It requires all agencies to develop an equity and inclusion plan, and then requires DPM, our division, to assess our AAEEO programs, collaborate with state agencies to collect and analyze relevant EI data, to develop and provide mandatory and professional development EI training opportunities for our employees. So I'm just going to go through these really quick. Um, initially, our State Council on Affirmative Action, which has been around for years and years and years, really focused on, you know, compliance efforts, um, those federal and state compliance efforts that we worked on as it relates to affirmative action and, and equal opportunity efforts, as well as our plans that are required for our agencies. Um, what the executive order did was expand the focus um, for them to really also focus on recruitment and retention efforts um, to assist with championing our um, diversity and inclusion efforts, and then to also help disseminate some of our, um, our state employment opportunities. They've been um, very instrumental in 
providing us feedback on some of our standards that we had developed for our, our equity and inclusion plans. They have been to some of our um, trainings that have been provided to our agencies. They've held strategic planning um, sessions just to make sure that they have um, a plan to move forward um, and how they want to do their work. Again, which is mostly focused on the workforce. Um, the requirement for all of the secretaries, the, the cabinet secretaries <clears throat> to attend the equity and inclusion training. So what we did is last year, and I have to say, um, and this is all of our cabinet agency secretaries, as well as deputies and assistant deputies, and they are such a great group to work with. They are always engaged. They have made it clear that equity and inclusion is a priority and very important to their agency. Um, and our sessions with them uh, around training on equity and inclusion has really given them an opportunity to share best practices, to look at some of the challenges that they've had at their agencies, um, and to also to share how they are planning to move forward. And so we were able to provide just a series that was focused on equity and inclusion training for our executive agencies. Um, as, far, as far as our equity and inclusion plans, one of the things that <coughs> we worked on, and when I say we, and this is my, um, me with my partner in crime, Larise Lincoln, we had worked on developing those standards for the equity and inclusion plans. And so what we did was we combined the requirements, which are um, both federal and state requirements for affirmative action. We combined the requirements for the affirmative action plans um, and then developed standards um, of requirements for the equity and inclusion plans into one so that we wouldn't having, so that we um, didn't have to have agencies producing both an affirmative action plan and an equity and inclusion plan. So those are combined into one report. So we work to um, um, develop the standards, provide guidance and support, um, provided a lot of training as well to develop those plans. So <coughs> excuse me, we required as part of our standards that all agencies focus on recruitment retention and workforce culture. We also required that, um, that they had very definitive goals, strategies, metrics, um, and we provided a template for them to use, that they also identify training needs to carry out those strategies and goals, and that there also be an evaluation monitoring, monitoring and then also ongoing um, reporting in place we spent a significant amount of time training. Um, those plans were due December, 2020, they're three-year plans. Um, and then they started um, in January of this year. And what you'll hear from the agencies, they will be reporting on some of their major activities for those plans. We also, as, as far as assessing our programs and collaborating with our agencies, we looked at our equity and inclusion reports. We looked at our personnel transaction data. We looked at some of our equity and inclusion related programs. And as a, re as, as a result, we have been able to revamp, expand, work on our outreach efforts for our EI programs. We also established metrics. We have provided regular data reports to agencies as needed. Um, just to make sure that they have what they needed as far as the data and the metrics and the regular reports. And we're also continuing to strengthen the utilization of some of our programs and continuing to look at and assess our programs and also looking at how we can continue to develop some of those diversity um, pipeline programs um, like our apprenticeship programs, our fellows programs. So we are looking at also how we can continue to create programs and expand on the programs that we have. And then lastly, we have developed mandatory training for our employees, our state employees around equity and inclusion. So we developed a curriculum that we worked on with our training team um, over the course of three to four months, very comprehensive training rolled that out, also made it virtual, 
um, have gotten really good feedback from our employees. And this was something that all 30,000 of our state employees were required to take. Um, we had that for our equity inclusion training, as well as our harassment and discrimination training. We have provided training to our administrators, our supervisors, and our employees, a series of equity and inclusion trainings over the course of the last year, and we're continuing to do so as well. So I just wanted to provide that quick update of some of the things that we're doing. Again, very comprehensive, what we're doing around equity and inclusion. Um, and you, you'll hear more on um, from what our agencies are doing. So with that, I will turn it over to Tondra, our director of our supplier diversity program. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tondra Davis, and I'm the director of the Wisconsin Supplier Diversity Program. And um, thank you all for having me today. Next slide. So um, today, what I'd like to talk with you about um, is kind of give you an intro to our supplier diversity program. I think is um, going to be um, hopefully very um, instrumental in some of the work that you do on um, this council. Um, and so to kind of give you an overview, we'll talk about the background of the program, our mission, um, what certification is and, and the opportunities it provides to our diverse suppliers. We'll talk a bit about Executive Order 59 as it relates to the Supplier Diversity Program, um, what our charge is, the progress we've made, um, the challenges we face, and then also some of the initiatives that we have. And there may be very brief time for a little, um, a few questions. Next slide. So the Supplier Diversity Program has been in existence since 1983, and it began with our uh, minority-owned business enterprise program. Um, and then in 2007, the woman-owned business enterprise um, um, certification was added. And finally, in 2011, we added our service-disabled veteran businesses. Um, in our program, we have three staff members. Two of them are equal opportunity specialists, and they really work on um, making sure that all the certifications that we have are processed um, um, annually and also um, um, every three years. Um, and I have been the director um, of the program since October of 2019. Currently, we have approximately 1,300 certifications. Um, and you can see they're listed um, 16, um, 650 are with our MBEs. We're at an all time high actually with our DVBs with only 44. So um, we're um, happy for that. And then we have our woman owned businesses um, at 607. Um, last year, fiscal year 20, we processed about $137 million um, in diverse pen to our suppliers. Next slide. So the mission for the Supply Diversity Program is that we certify those MBEs, um, DVBs, and um, WBEs. Um, and that gives them a better opportunity to do business with the state of Wisconsin and other entities, um, both government and private, that recognize the state cert certification. Um, next slide. What does certification mean? Um, basically, we're verifying, we're authenticating that a business is, um, has a majority ownership, either by a minority, a service disabled veteran, or a woman. So they have at least 51% ownership, and we're authenticating that. Um, not only are they owned, but they're also managed and controlled by that um, targeted population as well. And then also we wanna make sure that the business is serving a useful business function. It has customers other than the state of Wisconsin. And you can see that our program is um, governed by state statutes as well as administrative codes. Um, and I provided those numbers for you um, since you have access to the um, slide presentation and you'll be able to look at those um, further if you like. Um, for our program, we don't have a fee for our MBE program, but for our DVB and WBE program, um, certification is $150. And that is a three year certification period. Next slide. And so we mentioned that we certify them to give them better opportunity. And so what that means is the state of Wisconsin currently has um, spending goals with our MBEs as well as our DBBs. And with our MBEs, there's a 5% state um, spending goal. Um, keep in mind that it is a goal. 
It's not a set aside, nor is it a requirement, right? Um, if you look at this statute here that we have, um, 1675 sub 3 um, B2, um, this is the one that references our MBE program. Um, and so it basically says that um, agencies will um, shall attempt to ensure. Um, so that's where we kind of say that it's a goal, right? It, um, and then also it says that 5% of the total amount expended under chapter 16 in each physical uh, fiscal year is paid to minority businesses. So, um, so that's where we get that state spending goal of 5%. There's mirror language in um, um, sub three for that, that speaks to 1% for our DVB program. So that, that is the opportunity. Um, another part of the opportunity is that we provide a, um, the, the statutes provide a permissive 5% bid preference for the MBEs and DVBs. And let me explain further what that means. So um, Wisconsin buys um, for the most part on low bid. And so what happens is um, when there is a um, bid process, if you are MBE or a DVB certified through the state of Wisconsin supplier diversity program, if um, someone bid $100 and you as an MBE or DVB, you're allowed to bid up to $105 and still be able to get that state contract. So that is the opportunity um, that we provide um, to our certified suppliers. Next, next slide. So the vision for our program really um, became um, even more clear with Governor Evers Executive Order 59. Um, I, I told you that I started in October. Well, the very next month um, we had this executive order, um, November of 2019 related to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in state government. And of course, Clause 7 um, um, creates the council that we have here today. But Clause 6 speaks specifically through my, to my um, position, um, saying that um, the director shall assess and improve current procurement and contract processes, and then also um, develop new relationships and strategies to create and foster opportunities for businesses owned or operated by racial and ethnic minorities, women, and veterans. And so that really has become um, kind of the mission that we have for the program. Next slide. Although that is our mission and you know, kind of encompassed in that the charge and the things that we work on each and every day, um, we certify diverse suppliers, right? And we do that so that we can increase the pool of businesses that our agencies and our campuses have to, um, to purchase with. And so that involves a lot of marketing, it involves recruitment, education, training, and also serving as a B, um, business resource to those diverse suppliers. We also, you know, we need to know how the state is doing in terms of its diverse spend. So we spend quite a bit of time working to tabulate, um, analyze, and improve the state's diverse spend numbers. So that involves, um, we have to gather, gather the data, we have to validate it, we have to develop policies that, you know, will help us get a better spend, process improvement to help our diverse suppliers navigate our system. And also we build um, new relationships as also um, you, you found in the um, executive order. Next slide. So let's talk about our progress. Next slide on our diverse spend. So first of all, to help you understand what the diverse spend is, um, as we mentioned before, it's called, we call it kind of also chapter 16 spend. So all the um, in chapter 16 of the, the statutes, um, the spin that happens there is what is considered. And so as a part of that, number one, we have our general purchasing. So that's just basically goods and services that each of our state agencies and our UW campuses um, are, are buying. So um, it's, it's what they are buying. So, that, so that's general purchasing. Um, and then we have our vertical building. So if you think about all the state facilities, um, the buildings that we have, you know, be, the, be it maintaining new buildings or, or building new buildings or maintaining current facilities that we have um, around architecture and engineering and construction. So though that is a component that goes um, into the uh, diverse spin. And then finally, um, we have, we look at the Department of Transportation. And if you look with them, it's the horizontal building, horizontal um, roads, bridges, and things like that. On the state side of that spin, we count that towards um, our diverse spin. 
Next slide. So we are very, very thankful and pleased um, that in fiscal year 20, um, that ended in June of um, June 30th of 2020, for the first time in six years, um, that we met our um, 5% um, goal of uh, purchasing with the minority-owned businesses. And we actually, um, although our overall spend was 5.4%, with our minority-owned businesses, um, we had a 5.35% spend. So um, that was the first time in six years that we've met that goal, and for only the fifth time in the history of the program since 1983 that we met the goal. Um, and that we had about $137 million spent with um, our diverse suppliers. Next slide. So over the past five years, you can see here how we've trended in terms of the overall state spend. We hovered around four and a half percent for um, you know, 2016 to 2018, dipped in 2019 to under four percent, but then we were able to really, really um, kind of come back and have a 5.4 percent spend in fiscal year 20. Next slide. And I always like to look at how much money actually that means for our diverse suppliers, right? So um, from 2016 to 2019, we, we hovered around $120 million spent with our diverse suppliers. And we're so thankful that we we're able to add about $15 million um, this last fiscal year um, and have a spend with them of $137 million. Next slide. I provided this slide just as a, um, you know, something you can reference. You can kind of see in each of those four areas um, what the trends have been over the last um, 10 years in term of, terms of their spend. You can see here in um, architecture and engineering, um, you know, they had a high of, you know, 16.4% in 2013. And now that's kind of dwindled down to last year of only 2.85%. So you can kind of see some of the trends there and, and what's going on. Um, for your reference at a later point. Next slide. And so even though we were able to meet our um, spend goal for um, fiscal year 20 with our MBEs, we vow um, in, in supplier diversity, we're going to keep our foot on the gas. Not only that, you see that that's a work boot. <laughs> we realize we got work to do, right? Um, we, we can't um, just settle for, um, you know, you know, just making the goal. We want to exceed the goal even more. Um, next slide. And so the challenges though that we face are we, we are really working with our diverse suppliers to dispel the myth that you get state contracts. Um, I've spoken to so many suppliers who thought, you know, hey, I get certified. Now all these contracts are just going to come my way. So we're really just um, letting them know that, hey, you have to bid on these contracts. Not only do you have to bid, but you have to win them and do well. So um, th so that's that's a big um, initiative of ours. Uh, also, we um, are seeking to have full support across the enterprise and each agency and each campus. Um, it had been in the governor's um, budget, um, although it's been removed, but um, you know, to have a support person, really equity officers that could you know, kind of have the same vision that we have. Um, we need to dispel the, um, the chicken or the egg or the catch 22 that um, kind of happens um, with state contracts. You need experience to get the state contract, but you can't get the contract because you don't have any experience. So that's something that our suppliers um, deal with often. So we're, you know, we're really trying to navigate through that. Um, also, we're working, uh, our challenge is our subcontracting process. You know, we, we tell the uh, contractors that it's a, you know, you should have a goal of doing 5% with our diverse suppliers, but again, it's a goal, right? And also our reporting is not the best um, on this for us to be able to know actually what they did. Our statutes that govern the supplier diversity program are permissive, you know, you saw that, and also that they, you know, the shall attempt to ensure, you know, um, you can shall attempt to ensure a lot of things, you know, I want to lose 20 pounds. Well, I lost one or I gained five, you know, but I attempted, right? So that that gets um, that gets a little uh, tricky. And then finally, you, you saw we have a limited staff. I, I have two, like I said, certifiers, and then it's myself to um, kind of do all the other work that happens um, in the program. Next slide. 
But the strategies we've developed, um, we're thankful um, that they are um, working and, and proven to be um, successful with our number that we had this past fiscal year. Um, relationship building, you know, we're constantly working with those four groups um, that, that kind of feed into our supplier diversity number. Um, we work, we're working on our um, the spend reporting process. And then also um, in the past, we had only validated our diverse spend annually. So you can imagine if you, you balance your checkbook once a year, you know, how many things you forget and leave out and, you know, not have in the right spot. And so we're trying to do that monthly now. Um, we've made in-house improvements to kind of help our suppliers navigate our system. It used to take about three to five hours to review a brand new application. We've gotten that down to one to two hours. So, you know, really, really trying to streamline things. Um, we really focus a lot on, on recruiting um, diverse suppliers and training them as well, because the more um, diverse suppliers we have and, and, and more diverse um, fields and industries, then, you know, we have more opportunity for our agencies and our campuses to um, work with them and get contracts. And then, of course, we're working on policy development as well. Next slide. And so um, we have this slide in. Um, but again, as I mentioned, um, the executive budget, you know, we just really are thankful that the governor had in mind to expand our program. Um, although those things have been taken out of the budget, um, but these, you know, are some goals that we would certainly have in the future to increase the diverse spend to 10%, to uh, remove the certification, any, really any, you know, hoops and hurdles that prevent people from being certified and taking advantage of the opportunities that that would bring them. And then also, of course, um, staff. But again, that's been taken out of the budget. But, you know, hey, um, we, we're hopeful. We'll hope until the budget is signed <laughs> that maybe it could come back. But um, next slide. And so that's all I have for you. You know, we may have I don't know if we have time for questions, but um, I will put my information in the chat um, for anyone who does have questions. Um, feel free to contact me. Um, we are excited about the work that we're doing for supplier diversity and we'd love to talk to you. Thank you. So Tondra, thank you very much for your presentation this morning. We do have time for questions. I appreciate the way the information was aligned where you talked about the successes you're having and the challenges going forward and putting the monetary number in the slide. People always want to know the bottom line, what's the yes. money? Mm -hmm. And so your um, information, the supplier diversity program has had a lot of questions and a lot of discussion. So we're going to go quickly to questions. And the first hand I see is uh, our secretary, Amy Pacheca. So Amy? Hi, thank you so much, Tondra. This was an excellent presentation. So I just have a really quick question. One of the things I hear frequently from businesses trying to get certified is that there's a different process at the municipal, at the county, at the state, at the federal level. Is there any reciprocity in recognizing businesses that have gone through one certification? And can you speak to that at all? Yes, that, that is an excellent question. Thank you. Um, so there, you know, the term reciprocity, um, I wouldn't use that, but we do have, um, there is an executive order um, called the United Certification Program. So for those certifiers that are um, in the state of Wisconsin, um, well, there's four of them, uh, with, with DOT's program, with City of Madison, with Dane County, um, and I believe the city or county of Milwaukee, um, all of those, if you get certification with them um, through their federal contact or um, it's called Disadvantaged Business Program Enterprise, then you're able to come over to um, the state's program with a streamlined process. And they each recognize the, each other's D DBE. So, um, so that, that, that is, but in terms of the federal government, um, we, you know, that some of the SBA and things of that nature, no, but we do have a, a streamlined process. So if you were to go through um, DOT's DBE program, you could come on um, to our program. We're really trying to promote that. Um, we're thankful, um, probably in the last six months, we've really been trying to promote it. And we've 
I think we probably gotten a dozen or so applications that way. Whereas in the past, you know, you might see one or two trickle in all year. So, um, so it's starting to, uh, people are, it's starting to sync with people and they are starting to try to come over. Thank you for that. And just so you're aware, Tondra, there is a subcommittee that is really uniquely aligned with a lot of the work that you're doing in your supplier program that is headed by our subcommittee chair, LeVar Charleston. So know that he will be directly in touch with you. My guess is others will as well, but I wanted to especially bring that to your attention. So other One. questions that people have. Okay, well, uh, Latondra Davis has put her Hi. contact Secretary information Secretary in the chat. Secretary, Secretary Mai has her hand up. Perfect, thank you, Mai. Thank you so much. Um, Tan, Tantra, may I ask how long it takes to complete the application to obtaining the certification decision? Um. I'm hearing two questions there. To complete the application, um, it, it really is gonna depend on how um, well organized um, the business owner is. Um, it is an entirely online process. I put our website there, so there's um, all kinds of information. Um, we usually will have an answer within 30 days, or we will review the application within 30 days. If there are components missing or we need additional information, of course, we'll ask for that. But um, I'm saying within 30 um, days, however, we have been able to review applications um, due to our streamlined process within um, 10 business days um, re as of um, recently. So, um, so yes. May, Andrew, may I ask a follow-up question? Is, is application, I know it's online, is it English speaking only or is there an option to convert it to different languages? It is English speaking only. Um, I, I will mention, um, we are working with, uh, uh, we're doing actually a pilot program um, early June with um, the Hmong Chamber of Com um, Commerce, where we're, um, we call it a certification workshop. Um, we've requested or in our, um, in our flyer, asking the business owners as they come to our um, workshop, that they just have their documents available and we're gonna walk through the process of you know, step one, step two, having you know, translation available for those who need it um, so that they can leave that two hour session with a submitted application. And so- Yeah, I was just wondering how much language barrier might be an issue to completing that application. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And my thank you for raising that question to Tandra. That is a question that um, is now coming up across all state agencies as we are reviewing our websites and reviewing our um, information complaints and applications to ensure that they're more accessible. So thank you for raising that today. So Tanja, I again, thank you for your time and thank you for putting your information in the chat and for sharing uh, the diverse, diversity supplier program information. Believe me, we will be back in touch with you. <laughs> and so now we will move on to our next uh, section of the meeting. And in this section, we're gonna hear from our council cabinet secretaries, and they're gonna provide a brief overview of their agencies and the information that their agencies are currently working on surrounding equity and inclusion initiatives. Before we do that, I just wanna quickly thank Malika and her team, the capacity building that she was able to do for all of our agencies around equity, diversity, and inclusion is very very similar to the capacity building that we're building for the council this morning, just around how state government works. We just want to level set and ensure that everybody's on the same page regarding what this work entails and the expectation around the work. And that's what her team did for each of the state agencies. And so this morning, we're going to have updates from four of our agencies, the Department of Administration, the Department of Health Services, the Department of Children and Families, as well as the Department of Veteran Affairs. And we'll first begin with uh, Secretary Joel Brennan. Thank you, Secretary Krim. Um, and thanks to everybody for your participation 
today and in the last several weeks and the coming months um, on this council. It's truly important. And, and I get the chance today to talk a little bit about the Department of Administration, but I think um, as Secretary Krim just mentioned, you've had an opportunity to see in action some of the work that, um, that our department does through um, the presentation you just saw from Tandra, through the work of Malika, Laris, and others. You know, that is really um, at the heart of a lot of the work that we do at the Department of Administration. Um, you can go to the, the first slide if you want to here. Um, but really, the, uh, my other colleagues who will speak today um, you'll notice or you'll note that they have a, a much better defined constituency, uh, the Department of Health Services, Veterans Affairs, Children and Families. You can kind of envision um, the, the group and, and the stakeholders that they work with most directly for the most part um, in those areas. Within the Department of Administration, we really have some enterprise-wide functions and we have constituencies that are um, wide ranging. We are a service agency to the rest of state government. Uh, we certainly serve the, the governor, the legislature, our other, um, my colleagues in other cabinet agencies, and, and eventually the general public. But we really have a, a diverse set of, of issues um, and interests that we serve. We, we serve a lot of the enterprise-wide functions. Malika uh, is the division administrator over all of the human resource function for the 30,000 plus uh, state employees. We also serve uh, enterprise-wide functions in areas like real estate, fleet management, um, information technology, procurement. Um, we also manage uh, other areas of state government, the, the Capitol Police, the State Budget Office. We manage the relationships with the uh, Native American tribes when it comes to Indian gaming. Uh, we manage a lot of the relationships with local units of government. We also serve um, in a number of ways uh, functions providing uh, the opportunity to move federal resources into the state through the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So we do programs in, in housing and energy and community resources. So we also are very much involved in a lot of the administration of the funding that, uh, that comes into the state over the last year through the CARES funding and the coronavirus relief funding. And uh, we'll be very involved in the the rescue plan dollars that'll go out in the coming months um, that were part of the, the Biden administration that were passed back in March. So, so really the, the functions of the Department of Administration um, are a, a lot of it is enterprise wide. You can see on the slide here, some of the, the vision mission and, and some of the functions that we have, um, but um, from the governor's first days in office and, and even as he recruited us um, who are members of the cabinet, um, those commitments, his values of equity and inclusion are part of everything that we do and part of a lot of the work that's ongoing. I mean, part of the, the efforts that we have around increasing efficiency in government, innovation, um, making sure that we all have a customer focus, making sure that we um, have the, the most diverse and the strongest workforce possible, um, but also working on the security of operations in government and, and making sure that it's an open and transparent government. And, and equity and inclusion are infused in all of those. And, and in this administration and with this governor have continued to, to really push forward on those, establishing the systems and the frameworks to make equity and inclusion really integral to every aspect of not only our agency, but state government overall. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. Um, this talks a little bit about some of the things we're doing within our own department. You know, you have seen and heard uh, both today and, and, and prior some of the things that we're doing enterprise wide through Executive Order 59, the establishment of this council, um, the, the training that we've done for leaders across the enterprise. And I would say, um, I, I would echo what Malika talked about earlier, that that's been some of the richest dialogue and discussion, um, but not just dialogue in and of itself, but all, always tending toward action and the action steps that, that we want to take a, 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 as an administration as, as, and as leaders. And, and those are truly um, some of the, the uh, best conversations that we have had that have continued to, to move towards action. Um, we also work with uh, the, the uh, legislative caucuses. Um, the Malika and her team have worked with the Legislative Black Caucus um, significantly on a number of areas around equity and inclusion. This slide here has a number of the, er the areas that within the department that we are working on, you know, some of those tough but necessary conversations that we have had around equity and inclusion and around uh, just issues that we're dealing with not only in the state of Wisconsin, but across the country around diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's really been a hallmark of, of this administration and something that the governor has led 
Um, we established an equity and inclusion steering committee. It meets bi-weekly. It meets monthly with the secretary's office and our leadership across the, uh, the, the department. Um, we've established four employee work groups um, around issues of equity and inclusion. So we're really trying to, to move towards the tactical implementation of this. Um, we have significant involvement in the, the student diversity internship program. Um, there's about 112 positions there in the current year. More than 30% of the, the applicants were uh, students of color. And, and in, this is about almost a 50-year-old program, and it hasn't necessarily all always met the needs of diversity and inclusivity in this state. And so we're moving more in that direction and, and trying to ensure that, um, that, that this really serves um, not only the immediate needs of students, but also builds towards the workforce that we want and we need to be strong um, in the coming generation of state workers. We've um, employed a, a 360 degree pulse survey um, and we'll be using that to, to really inform a lot of the work that we're doing moving forward. Um, in the current quarter, some of the things that we're doing are around training. We um, did a, a new enterprise learning management system um, in the current year, and, and we really have uh, provided some additional training opportunities across the enterprise. This is one area, you know, we have all been changed over the last year, but government has been changed as well. And so the opportunity for virtual involvement or doing these things online is something that more and more people have an opportunity to do. And and we'll be meeting those needs moving forward. Um, and again, you, you see other things that we're doing here. We will be updating um, and, and taking a look at those mission, the vision and values with an eye towards the equity lens, not necessarily throwing out all those, but really informing the work that we continue to do around equity and inclusivity um, as we move forward. And, and really, as, was, um, as Tandra mentioned too, and others have mentioned, the priorities for the governor were laid out in the budget. Um, and even if the legislation, even if the legislature isn't necessarily going to meet all of those priorities with us, um, we're going to continue to move forward on those issues. And, and that's a directive from the governor. I'll, we'll uh, head to the last slide here. It just gives you a couple of specifics. Again, Tandra went over the supplier diversity program. Um, I think she may have even uh, shortchanged herself and, and the work that, that has been done, you know, the, really the, the ter terrific outreach that's been done and the, the new businesses that have been able to uh, become part of that program. Again, that's the first step. The next step is ensuring that uh, amongst the, across the enterprise and amongst our colleagues that there continues to be that focus and that they can um, take part in that opportunity and, and grow their businesses and grow their opportunities uh, once they get that certification. And, and the training and the support that she was, uh, is doing, um, the discussion just about what's going on with the Hmong Chamber and, and just that kind of outreach leads to opportunity. And those are things that, are, again, have been a, um, have, have really been jump-started under Tondra's leadership and will continue in this administration. The last thing I'll just mention is um, around the, the rescue plan dollars. And, and the state has significant funding, about two and a half billion dollars to, uh, to deploy uh, on, around the recovery. Um, some of that will be around the specific needs that still are there in the public health response to COVID-19, but uh, the lion's share of that will go towards the economic recovery. The governor has already outlined a $50 million equitable recovery program that will be uh, administered out of the Department of Administration. This will be for community partners around the state who are doing work to eliminate disparities, promote equity and inclusion around our state. Um, but really, it, it, it uh, will serve to ensure that, as the governor said, we, we have a Badger bounce back. But it's not just bouncing back to where we were 16 months ago, but bouncing back to um, ensure that, that there are, can be more and more members of our state, and more and more people around the state who can uh, be part of that equitable recovery and be part of the opportunities that we have in the state. There are other things that we're doing with the federal money around um, the, our utility and rental assistance program that have an equity lens to it. All the work that's happening around the small business grants, making sure that the state does that. Um, beyond the classroom grants, to, to um, our partners at the local level who are working with uh, out of school learning programs. So all of this will be infused in, in the work that we will be doing over the coming months to ensure that those dollars get out there efficiently, effectively, um, and, and there will be this council and, and people in this um, who are working in these this effort will help inform the work that we're doing moving forward. Um, Joel, thank you. My, my time there, but it's, I'll, I'll move on to the next. 
Thank you, Joel, very much. And mm -hmm. so now I'll move on to Secretary Timberlake of the Department of Health Services. Thank you, Secretary Krim, and good morning, everybody. Let's go right to the next slide so we can start to dive in. So we are uh, sometimes thought of as the largest state agency, and what I need to let you all know is we are not the largest state agency, but we are the most complicated, is what I would say. Um, so our mission, as you see there at the top, is that we will protect and promote the health and safety of all people across the state of Wisconsin. And we do that, of course, in partnership with all of our colleagues across state government, but also in partnership with service providers and advocacy organizations and local government officials and many, many others all across the state of Wisconsin. I wanted to highlight for you just a couple of our key program areas that I'm going to imagine many of you will have heard of or will have interacted with in some way. So, uh, for this current state fiscal year, our overall uh, budget for our department is about $13 billion. $11 billion of that is reflected in our state's Medicaid program. And so that's why that's the, the first uh, little sub point there on the slide. So many of you may have heard of the BadgerCare Plus program that provides a, acute and primary medical care to kids and parents and pregnant women and adults and uh, others across our state. In addition, we have many people in our state with long-term care needs. They need support either living in their homes or they need to be supported in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And those kinds of supports are covered also by the Medicaid program, often through additional programs known as family care and the IRIS program. In addition, you may know people with children with long-term support needs, and they also are able to get support through the Medicaid program. We also are responsible for a great deal of program and policy development. You heard TR's discussion earlier about the levels of policy making that go on, and certainly in our case, that's true all throughout our work. In the areas of mental health and substance use disorder services, we fund prevention and treatment services that are delivered again through the Medicaid program and also directly out to often our county partners and others in local government who are delivering those kinds of programs and services locally. Uh, we are, of course, the state's lead public health agency, and as Secretary Brennan noted, uh, this has been the year plus, I'm afraid, of COVID-19. We, while we continue to be that lead public health expertise agency in the COVID response and really do lead the coordination at this point of the staffing and the um, delivery of services, testing, vaccination, contact tracing, the other things that we know about, we do that again in partnership with so many of you uh, on, this, on this call and this meeting and all across state government. We also have a regulatory and an oversight function, which is maybe not quite as well known, so we do inspections, licensing, certification for the healthcare provider types that are listed there. We respond to complaints and we do our very best to make sure that people are, are safe and well cared for. We also uh, have the privilege of working with Governor Evers and the administration on a variety of, of specialty projects and initiatives. A couple of interest, I think, to this group would be um, there is a, a council on health equity that is a sister organization, we think, to this council. More to come on that. And uh, the governor recently convened uh, an entire task force on the role of caregivers across our state and developed many state budget recommendations out of that work. Next slide, please. In terms of the equity and inclusion work that uh, we are working on within the Department of Health Services, what I really want to underscore here is the tremendous leadership that has been provided by our staff. So I am a relatively new uh, member of, of this administration and member of this team. I joined the department back in January. I was the secretary back in a prior life, um, but uh, have just been back since the end of January. And what I, what I inherited when I walked in the door is, was a robust set of working groups that are reflected there, again, being led by our staff, some of whom are in management level positions, others of whom are in kind of frontline staff roles who have been working tirelessly for months 
to really reinvent the way the department approaches equity and inclusion in its, in its hiring, in its promotion, its employment practices, and also, of course, in our program areas. I neglected to say that we employ over 6,000 people, and so this is uh, tremendously important work. I think the, um, the most exciting thing I can tell you is that on Monday, we will be announcing that we are recruiting for a brand new director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. That director will lead a newly reconfigured Office of Health Equity. And as a number of my colleagues have noted, certainly the governor prioritized creating those kinds of director level roles in the state budget. Our uh, Joint Finance Committee has opted not to move forward with that, but we at DHS, with our partners at the Department of Administration, Malika, uh, Larice, and team, have uh, moved forward with a reorganization anyway. And so we're very excited to announce the creation of that new office and that new director. That really is where the work of our further workforce analysis and action planning will live. That, that's really where it will be spearheaded. I'll say that our team has been focusing on those senior manager level roles as, as a real area of focus, knowing that that's such an important pipeline, knowing that one of the main reasons people leave state government or really leave any job is a perceived lack of opportunity for advancement. So we really need to be working uh, and focusing on those, those kind of senior manager and middle manager level roles. And then finally, maybe the last thing I'll say uh, to, to try to keep us on track here is that in addition, historically, many state health departments like ours have had a program that has lived in public health called uh, a minority health program, which we all could decide that that's a bit of an outdated uh, term at this point, but in fact, that's a sort of nationwide function that state health departments have. So we are gonna elevate that minority health program up out of the division of public health. It will become part of this broader office of health equity. So it will be at the level of the secretary's office in our department, which will give it clear visibility and clear responsibility across um, the entire enterprise. So it's a wonderful department, lots of great work going on every day. Welcome you all to think about how you join us. I didn't even mention that we have other boards and councils that many other external stakeholders can sit on to Flora's presentation, but I'll come back and talk about that at some other time. So thank you, Secretary Grimm, back to you. Great. Thank you very much for that overview and for that reorganization around specifically focused on equity and inclusion uh, at your agency. So next up, we have our Department of Children and, Family, Children and Families, Secretary Amundsen. Thank you, Secretary Krim. And we can go straight to the next slide. Um, so as you can see, I, um, the Department of Children and Families is, uh, is just a, a far reaching array of programs. We're a relatively young agency. Um, we are about 12 years old and really our agency was born out of looking across programs that span um, DHS and DWD and even some DOC elements. Uh, that were, were brought together really through that lens of supporting children and their families. And um, you can really see when you look down this list just how far reaching and sort of disparate these programs are, but what both drives us and connects us in our approach to implementing all of these programs is our shared vision. And, and that vision is really what roots us uh, together and what forces us out of those silos uh, into thinking about the whole child, the whole family and the whole community. So uh, for us, our vision, our future state is that all Wisconsin children and youth are safe, and loved as members of thriving families and communities. And my favorite word in that, um, in that vision statement is thrive. I think it's such an active and aspirational word for the kind of services that we want to provide uh, and the partnerships that we wanna seek with, with community. So each of my divisions at DCF operate from a strategic plan that centers that vision and really really looks at that vision in its, in its future state. How do we get there? But also roots equity and access at the heart of how we strive to deliver those services. 
Um, and that's really important. That's work we've done over the last two years. That's a brand new vision for our agency since we've been here. Um, and the strategic plans that I've asked my divisions to, uh, to, to create with their teams, with their staff, um, flow from that. Um, but as we all know, anybody who's participated in strategic plan writing know that um, writing the words on the page is one th thing, truly making the goal part of the muscle memory of the almost 1,000 staff that we have at DCF, well, that's a more difficult proposition. And so we quickly realized the need for some central coordination to ensure that all of our efforts around equity and access and inclusion um, are not isolated activities. They're not one-off activities or one-off initiatives, but that they lead to equity truly becoming embedded part of agency culture. What does it mean to work at DCF? So last year we designed and hired a new position in the secretary's office um, as part of our leadership team to take on this task of culture. Um, merging our words with our actions, which is to me the, the, the opportunity we have to make lasting impact, lasting imprint on, uh, on the way that we deliver our programs um, here at DCF. So next slide. Um, we have done so much work in this area, uh, but I'd just like to, to, to offer a few um, to paint a picture. And again, we can come back to this. Uh, so we have designed with staff um, a, an embracing equity and fostering inclusion set of trainings. This work was really rooted in our equity and inclusion advisory committee, but it was accelerated through, um, through these strategic planning efforts. Uh, this, this training is mandatory for all of our staff and, um, and really matters, I think, that it was developed internally and it is led by staff members. These are half-day interactive sessions. Um, so that's a really important um, aspect is, is, is this is designed for us and delivered by folks we know in our, um, in our agency. Um, Next, next uh, initiative that we've we've grown up is the idea of really looking at staff as our greatest asset and wanting to identify the potential barriers to equity and inclusion in our recruitment, in our hiring, in our promotion process. And this is work that um, Karen spoke about, but but work that um, that we really take seriously in our agency as well. We've implemented um, something we're calling Anywhere in Wisconsin Hiring Philosophy, and this is something we're doing with our, our managers across programs um, with the goal to expand our recruitment radius through um, our remote work options and our regional work options around the state. We have six regional offices around the state. So we're really seeking to attract candidates more equitably throughout the state, especially to areas with more racial and ethnic diversity. We're also um, asking the question, we've got excellent research analysts who work for us and we're asking that question, um, where, where are we weak and where are we strong in our hiring, our recruitment and our retention? We recently analyzed each step in our hiring process and we found that we are losing more racially and ethnically diverse candidates during the interview process, earlier in the interview process. And so we're really focusing with a laser on our interview process right now, um, trying to understand what do we need to do um, within staff training, within our process to ensure that our system is equitably um, equitably treating applications and, and through that process. And then finally, just um, looking at the role of things like listening sessions. Uh, we've talked a lot about councils and committees, but recognizing the importance of voices in the communities that we serve, um, trying to find those two-way mechanisms for stakeholder um, input, but also just two-way communication mechanisms. And then um, using a lot of race and equity analysis tools to identify um, the places where our policy options, where our policy uh, decision-making uh, can really be better, um, I, I would say better connected to our goals for um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So just a few examples there. And, and again, I'm anxious to talk more about this in subgroups in future meetings. Thank you, Dawn.
Great. Thank you very much, Secretary Amundsen. It's good to see the step through of the creation of the position and the work that's taking place at your agency and the emphasis on evaluation tools. I think you might be hearing from quite a few of us on the council regarding that work you're doing. Uh, and so last, but certainly not least, I'm going to move over to Secretary Mary Kolar from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Secretary Krim. If we could uh, move on to the next slide, but I just want to emphasize what a pleasure it is to serve on the Governor's Equity and Inclusion Advisory Council. I share your commitment and WDVA's commitment to the principles of this council. So as you can see, WDVA's mission is to work on behalf of Wisconsin veterans community, veterans, their families, and their survivors in recognition of their service and sacrifice to our state and to our nation. We have over 1,000 staff who work with aging veterans in our veterans homes, those veterans with mental health and substance use disorders, veterans who need assistance navigating the complicated federal claims process for disability and pension, families who are laying a veteran to a final rest, veterans and families seeking to learn and celebrate our state's military history and many others who seek grants, benefits, and other support. To best serve the approximately 3,500 men and women veterans in Wisconsin and their families, we need to have a workforce that is representative of the diverse population of veterans in our state. By building a diverse and inclusive workforce, the agency will better serve and understand those veterans we serve. Next slide, please. The Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs is firmly committed to equal employment opportunity and affirmative action. As part of our commitment, we intend to apply diversity, equity, and inclusion principles to all employment policies procedures and programs. WDVA's employee-led Cultivating Culture Committee works to evaluate and improve our efforts at recognizing the valuable contributions of our employees, promote positive morale, celebrate diversity, and foster a collaborative work environment. A group of volunteers representing all of the work areas I mentioned helped to develop our equity and inclusion plan, which is now being implemented by our human resources team with input from the Cultivating Culture Committee and its diversity subcommittee. The four main areas that we are focusing our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts are recruitment, retention, training, and culture. I won't read the entire slide, but one of the projects we are currently working on is developing a better, better context and recruitment list. Our HR team is meeting directly with groups such as the YWCA Madison and Black Young Professionals Milwaukee to tap into their networks. I'm also looking forward to getting more data from TAM on which is replacing WISC jobs on applicant demographics so that we can continually improve our recruitment efforts. I recently received a presentation on this new technology and believe it will be very helpful. Once we have more employees that meet our equity and inclusion goals, we need to retain them. Our committee is currently reviewing the onboarding process and structure to identify areas of opportunity. We are looking at a mentorship program where new employees will have someone they can turn to with any type of question they have. And our Cultivating Culture Committee is working on programming and events to reflect on, promote, and celebrate our diverse state. We've also been implementing training for employees and supervisors. Much of that training is already underway. Another idea our volunteer group came up with is a monthly coffee talks where supervisors come together informally to learn, train, and collaborate. I'm very proud of the employees at WDVA who reviewed our processes and protocols and are now seeking to find new opportunities for inclusion and equity. 
I also appreciate all of these presentations as we can learn from one another and we build upon each other's ideas and solutions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Secretary Kolar and Secretary Osmussen, Timberlake, and Brennan for your presentations. I just think about the cultivating culture, the, the vision, the equity tools, what I appreciate in hearing in these presentations, and I hope the council also appreciates, is the focus on equity that our state agencies have and how we're looking to incorporating those additional perspectives and ideas from council members, from the subcommittees to further move our work forward at our agencies. So thank you. And then speaking about veterans, I want you all to be aware that Governor Evers has signed Assembly Bill 154, which is now Wisconsin Act 31, designating May 14th as Hmong Lao Veterans Day in Wisconsin. The governor issued Executive Order 115, ordering flags of the U.S. and the state of Wisconsin to be flown at half-staff today in honor of those Hmong Lao veterans. And so, again, just wanted to acknowledge that. I actually had a feed on my Facebook page from my good friend Ping Her last night, in which we uh, interacted a bit around that. And so uh, to our Hmong and Lao members of the council, um, we honor you and we thank you for you and your family's contributions. And so with that, we are going to move into our update from Governor Evers and Lieutenant Governor Barnes. So I welcome them to our meeting this morning. Welcome, Governor. Thanks so much, Don. And uh, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Just wanted to double check the technology here. Yeah, thanks Thanks so much, uh, Secretary Krim. And uh, uh, also, um, uh, it, it was a great event this morning, very uh, pleasing to, uh, uh, to be honoring those veterans that served uh, our country in a very difficult war and, uh, and, they, and also to honor their, uh, their contri contribution to life in Wisconsin. So I, it, it, was, it, it fit right into the discussion. It, it, was, it was quite a uh, quite, a, quite a great event and uh, I just love being part of it. So again, uh, pleasure to be back again for your second uh, meeting. Uh, also congratulations to Mai Zhang for, uh, for uh, taking on the vice chair work. I appreciate that. And, uh, and of course, all the good subcommittee work that's going on. Looking forward to working with all of you. Since this last weekend, our work, uh, unfortunately already faced a setback as uh, uh, the Republicans on the Joint Finance Committee uh, took out hundreds of budget items from our budget, which we call Badger Bounce Back Agenda. Uh, among the items removed from our budget included several equity issues. And so I just wanna go through them quickly, but also uh, uh, summarize in a way that uh, I, I nothing that will dissuade me from the work of this committee, even what happened in the budget. But the, uh, uh, they took out the equity grant program, which would have set aside $10 million uh, through the biennium for grants to ent entities to promote diversity and, and advance equity and inclusion. Uh, they also took out of the budget cabinet level chief equity officer uh, position and, and also other equity officers throughout the administration. Uh, we had a fellowship program that we were hopeful for, and uh, that is no longer in the budget. We asked for an Office of Environmental Justice, uh, declaring uh, Juneteenth a state holiday, uh, internship program or on equal opportunity, and making sure it was an equal opportunity program. Uh, again, uh, expand, expanding supplier diversity goals for state procurement, position funding for a Latinx outreach specialists at, uh, at our agricultural. Uh, uh, agency, DATCAP, and, uh, and our health equity grants. And so, well, and am I disappointed that this happened? Yes, of course I am. But I just want to assure all of you that I absolutely, absolutely am committed to the work of this council. In fact, in my humble opinion, it makes the work of this advisory council that much more important 
so we can focus on the equity work that uh, that is really important and that we control. So as you've seen this week, uh, we, we learned that Wisconsin is, uh, just as another aside, uh, I just wanna let you know, if you read this in a paper, Wisconsin was expected to, will, will be receiving $700 million less than was originally estimated in President Biden American Rescue Plan. And clearly the, the plan itself uh, uh, does have a, a, an equity focus to it in several of that uh, areas, but, uh, but we uh, surprisingly uh, lost out on 700 million. We still, are, st still will be receiving about $2.5 million or billion dollars, excuse me. The, uh, the, the reason for that is, uh, is one that uh, I guess we can be proud of. Our unemployment rate is actually better shaped than it was pre previously thought and it's in better shape than most other states in, in the country. So that just goes to show that our relief and recovery investments over the last year uh, have had a positive impact on our state and uh, in the pandemic or our state recovering from the pandemic. Regardless, the bottom line is, is our goal to still get these funds out the door as quickly as possible so that people who have been most impacted by COVID-19 get the re, uh, relief they desperately need. And lastly, and I know we had a, a new update from Washington yesterday, but I, I wanna just give you a quick update on COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we continue to be a national and regional leader in getting available shots in the arms and so far, more than a third of Wisconsinites, well over a third, I think it's about 38 percent, uh, are fully vaccinated against COVID-19, and about uh, 46, 47 percent received at least one dose, with um, uh, about 2.6 million doses administered statewide. This is great news. We're headed in the right direction, as you know. Yesterday, uh, the Biden administration, through the uh, Center for Disease Controls, uh, controlled. Um, announced that uh, those of us who have uh, have had are fully vaccinated uh, can, for the most part, uh, dispose of using our masks. And and so, all you know, state government is taking a look at those recommendations as well as uh, uh, all the all the county public health people. But the the the, the, the message I, I I leave around this is there's a there's a reason why we're at where we're at, and that is that the uh, that the people of Wisconsin and frankly, the people in the country uh, are getting shots. And uh, every shot that uh, they get uh, saves lives. And frankly, um, uh, I'll put it in this kind of gross uh, concept or construct is those people that do not get shots are costing lives. And so we should be, we should feel good. This is, this is a good day for us uh, as a state and a nation. We should celebrate the fact that we are we are moving in a good direction, but the uh, uh, we still have a ways to go. We still have a lot of people that need to be vaccinated, and we'll continue to work with our local communities and trusted organizations to make sure that we get every every person possible vaccinated in the state. So again, just to just, uh, cycle back to the first things I was talking about, regardless of the decisions that were made. In the legislature by the by the uh, Republicans on the Joint Finance Committee, I am committed to the work of this council. So with that, I want to thank you again for all the critical, critically important work you do, and look forward to our continued work together. And Don, it's back to you. Great. Thank you very much for that update. And we do have a few minutes um, for questions that people may have. Um, uh, for Governor Evers. So any questions? And Larice will again monitor the hand raising in the chat. The other thing I did want to also mention is I wanted to thank um, Secretary Timberlake and DHS for all the incredible work that they are doing to ensure that Wisconsin is a national leader in terms of the distribution of vaccinations and getting shots into people's arms. So we thank you, Secretary Timberlake. It is a team effort, as I know everybody knows, it starts with the governor and we will convey that to the team. Thank you. So wondering if there are any questions for the governor. Currently, there's a wonderful comment thanking the governor for all of his hard work. And we all um, 
believe that sentiment. Um, currently, there are no questions that are being asked at this moment. Well, that, that was the most complete uh, uh, speech and or commentary that I've ever given because, because, no, because no one has a question. Anyway, keep up the good work. That's the bottom line. Uh, don't don't uh, try not to engage in the huffing and puffing in the legislature that whatever they do, they're going to do and whatever I do, I'm going to do. And uh, so I'm, I'm really uh, I'm really pleased that we will be able to accomplish a lot through this committee. Governor, I think I spoke too quickly. We do have a question for you. Okay. Um, Governor Evers, do you feel that the removal of diversity efforts in your budget were disproportionately removed as compared to other items removed? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. They took out 400, 400 items. So um, I, I, I feel it's disproportionate in, in this way. Uh, I think every, every program that had uh, the word equity or diversity or inclusivity uh, as part of the description uh, is no longer in the budget. So it, I'd say it's not necessarily disproportionate to the uh, 400 items that uh, were, were taken out, but in that, in the, in the broad scheme of things, uh, uh, when all of them I have been uh, taken out, uh, I'd say that's, that's a target, yes. That was a target. But again, uh, please, please, uh, you know, we, 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 are a, we are a large state government. We have lots of employees. We have, do a lot of good work for people all across the state of Wisconsin. What this, this uh, council can, uh, can and, and we, we, we ask people to be on this council because of their good experience and what they can provide advice to us. And uh, from the private sector or other public sectors, uh, we've got a lot to, lot to learn and a lot that we can accomplish uh, through the administration of, uh, of our uh, state government. So uh, this, this don't, don't, please don't look at this as, uh, as something that will derail uh, anything that you uh, suggest. Great, thank you, Governor Evers. And thank you. thank you for sticking around and hearing some of our forward work that's now happening. We've spent the last hour and a half or so building capacity. And now this segment of the council we're moving to, we're gonna be talking about specifically the work of the council and our initial foundation. So stay tuned. Take, take care, thank you. Yep, thank you. So what I'd like to do next is um, shift our focus uh, to us uh, and the work that we're doing, because as the governor has just pointed out, the commitment to this work and the commitment to this council is stronger than ever. And so the actions that we take are going to continue to move equity, diversity, and inclusion forward in Wisconsin state government. And so what I would like to do now is just talk a bit about the process used to uh, review the submits in terms of subcommittee selection, as well as leadership, and then have each of our leaders uh, talk a bit about um, the vice chair work that it will take place, as well as the subcommittee work. And so with that, I want to again thank each of you for um, being a part of this council, you are all leaders. So this is a council of leaders. And so I appreciate those who um, submitted their um, information regarding serving as a subcommittee lead, as well as their top three rankings of their subcommittee choices. And so when we receive those choices to balance out the subcommittees, uh, we try to lean on that first or second uh, selection um, for which subcommittee people ended up being a part of. And so there was some of interest in the subcommittees that each of you have been placed on.
And so also as part of the survey, we asked people to write in any interest in leadership roles. And I appreciated reading the information as did the committee, because we got a chance to learn a little bit more about each of you that submitted information. And we appreciate the good work that you are doing at your organizations and in your communities. And so when we move to um, how those selections were made, we were looking at geographic, we were looking at um, expertise brought to the role, and that's how we were able to make uh, the decisions. And so with that, we were able to select Mai Zong as our vice chair. Mai Zong is out of Eau Claire, and she'll talk a little bit about um, her role as the vice chair. And then we were able to select LeVar Charleston as the lead for our economic and business development. Robin Davis uh, out of Brown County, United Way, as the lead for data and policy. And then Secretary Mary Kolar um, has stepped up as our lead for the subcommittee regarding community engagement. And so some of the roles and responsibilities that we will be following is my position as the chair, I will primarily focus on leading the council, moderating these quarterly meetings, but I also am in collaboration with the governor's office and the Department of Administration, uh, Secretary Brennan, as well as Malika's team in looking at and talking through next steps for the council, what capacity building might we need, and then how we'll begin shifting our focus onto the nuts and bolts of the council's work. In addition, I field any inquiries that come from external constituents. So for example, Secretary Timberlake talked about the health equity team as our sister council. I talk regularly with that chair to ensure that our work is coordinated. I also have met with the financial task force led by DFI Secretary Blumenfeld to talk about how they might infuse some of the equity and inclusion work that we'll be doing here into the work of their task force. Also re recently, uh, the federal government has pulled together Region 5, which is Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, and Michigan. And those state government leads talked about equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, efforts that are happening within their state. And I, along with Larice Lincoln, presented information about what's happening here in Wisconsin so that as a collective region, we are all elevating the conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion and the action plans and the forward motion that these governors are wanting to see take place across state government uh, in our region five. And then I also uh, field complaints and issues and concerns that arise um, from individuals around the state and filter them to the appropriate location because those uh, that type of information is beyond the purview of this council. However, I serve in a role of moving that information to the appropriate place. And so next, I'll have Mai introduce herself and talk a bit about the coordinating work that she'll be doing as the vice chair. Mai? Secretary Krim, actually the lieutenant governor has his hand raised. Oh, okay. He's arrived. Sorry yes. about that. I'm glad he has arrived. Uh, lieutenant Mandela Barnes, please jump in and speak up. Hey, well, thank you so much. Uh, just didn't want to interrupt anybody. You had a good thing going on. So uh, we had a we had a different link for whatever reason. So I was hanging out in some waiting room on Zoom. Uh, but I am happy to be here. Uh, happy to have a chance to, to to speak to you all. And I know the governor had to get out of here. Just want to you know, just reiterate the thanks for his leadership, especially uh, in terms of uh, these issues, because we didn't go into this assuming there would be no opposition in the legislature. Uh, that's the unfortunate reality of it. But if we sit back and do nothing, uh, I think we'll be in an even worse position. And that is not an option. We can't remain silent. And 
we can't remain stagnant. And that's why we have this group of people who are dedicated and committed, who have demonstrated a desire to see this work through. And the work that is going to take place uh, in this council is going to be even more important now since the uh, Joint Committee on Finance uh, took some incredibly frustrating and disturbing steps when they did decided to pick apart the budget. But we've always had equity and sustainability as priorities. They're gonna to continue to be priorities. And this is important to our state because it is the thing that has held us back for so long, the lack of equity and the lack of sustainability. And we incorporated this into so many different uh, facets of the administration, specifically our climate work. And the Office of Environmental Justice is an example of that. And that's why I just wanna say thank you to everybody who's taken the time uh, to participate. And one of the bigger issues we've been dealing with uh, is water. You know, we're surrounded by three bodies of fresh water, Lake Michigan to the east, Lake Superior to the north, and uh, the Mississippi River to the west. It's essential for life and it's essential for our quality of life, our recreation, our ecosystems, wildlife, agriculture, and our drinking water. And because of that, we have a lot of water quality issues that we need to pay particular attention to. That could be PFAS contamination, nitrates, lead, algal blooms, et cetera. And that's why we are doing the work to make sure that we invest in making sure uh, that quality of life is respected regardless of where you live in this state, regardless of what your income is, regardless of uh, what your family status may be. And paying that particular attention just has not been the uh, case in Wisconsin, but we are here to make sure uh, that we change that. So I just wanna say thank you all uh, for everything. And uh, there is still so much more work to do. We all know this isn't going away overnight. And I like to think that we're just getting started. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this state is late to the party in terms of uh, equity, uh, but historically Wisconsin has been a leader in issues of equity and issues of equality. And I believe that the work that we do here can help get us back to that place. So just wanna say thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules uh, because there's nothing more valuable than your time and the dedication you have to this work. It's going to take us to where we need to go. So thank you so much for having us. Great. Well, I thank you for your time. And we do have a moment or two if there are any questions for the Lieutenant Governor. Yeah. And I think what we're in a situation where it's exciting to just have you here and to hear <laughs> your words. And so if you do have a few moments, feel free to hang out um, so you don't get caught in the other waiting rooms. And then okay. you can listen in on some of the forward work that we're going to be doing um, as a uh, subcommittee. But I will pause just for one more moment to see if there's uh, questions that have come up. Yes, we do have one question for the Lieutenant Governor. Besides the, the multitude of thank yous for being here and being so supportive, Lieutenant Governor, the waters you mentioned, are they bordered on other states? Um, what is the relationship with them? Yeah, um, Michigan and Minnesota, and I guess Iowa as well. And, you know, uh, so I, I guess... Um, to that point, we are dealing with a number of interstate issues with one with Minnesota, one with uh, one with Michigan as well, with uh, mining operations, and the other one is a uh, pipeline issue that we are going to have to deal with. Uh, but you know, it's, we can't just solve it on our own, and both of those are tied up in courts right now. The problem is with those two issues is indigenous communities, indigenous lands that uh, would be essentially irreparably harmed or could potentially be irreparably harmed um, if both of those projects were to move forward. So uh, that's why water quality remains an issue. And uh, we have to think about uh, how infrastructure can negatively or positively impact. We have to think about what sort of infrastructure we want to be uh, building, what makes the most sense. And if we're having infrastructure that uh, interrupts or disturbs or disproportionately impacts quality of life, then we have a problem. 
Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Again, just, yep, additional, just additional thank yous again for your leadership. It's so much appreciated and refreshing. Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, we can't do any of this alone. So uh, it's, it's your leadership that, that I appreciate. Great. Well, so what I'd like to do now is um, transition back to the um, leader, the leadership focus of the subcommittees and the overall council work. I talked a bit about um, my connection and how um, I'm moving the work forward in collaboration with the governor's office and lieutenant governor's office, as well as DOA. And so now I will have uh, our vice chair, my song, uh, introduce herself and talk about her collaborative efforts. Thank you so much, uh, Madam uh, Krim. And thank you all. I am very excited and thrilled. Um, also very honored to be working alongside this entire council. Um, thank you so much to the governor and Lieutenant Governor for your continued commitment to the equity and inclusion work. Um, I know that this council will be bringing amazing results and will also be providing a platform that will move our entire state into a new culture um, of embracing diversity and, and elevating all people in Wisconsin, not just some, but all. And when I say all, we're also talking geographic location and uh, we're talking ethnicity. Um, you know, my goal as the vice chair is really to, to work with our leads, to work with our committee leads and to create synergy between the different sub, the three subcommittees. Um, we're all very work, we're all working really hard on uh, very common goals. Um, so that is very important in, in my role is to also be able to support and pull together the connective tissues of um, the different committees and ad identifying what those common goals are between the committees so that we could support and bring together a cohesive working committee uh, to ensuring that by the end of you know, our term um, that our entire state of Wisconsin is in mind and we have a solid plan that will address this, that it's going to be not just a temporary plan, but a foundation for our new generations and moving forward. And so I'm excited to working with our uh, subcommittee leads. You'll see me every now and then hopping in as a fly in the wall in your council meetings, but um, I am here to support in any way I can and for us to really do the work and move it forward. Great, thank you very much, Mai. And Mai and I uh, meet quite regularly, as you can imagine, to coordinate up and down and across. And so the goal for this first year is to have in place the creation of action plans with measurable goals for each subcommittees. And so we, of course, do have some time. We're about midway through um, our first year here in the second meeting, but that is the, the eye of the goal. And so next I will have our three subcommittee leads talk about their uh, subcommittees and what transpired in their first meeting. And so first up, we'll have uh, Robin Davis, the subcommittee lead for data and policy. Thank you, Te Secretary Krim, um, and good morning uh, to everyone, uh, council, fellow council members. Um, I, I really uh, appreciate the depth of information that we were provided with um, today and giving us that level set and context. Um, around what is happening across uh, government, as well as the leadership, as has already been stated, from um, you know our highest office in the state. And, and for those of us doing this work, that's what we say. We've got to have support all the way through um, so that we can continue to elevate um, the challenges before us and also the successes um, opportunities. So um, the data and policy subcommittee was actually combined. Um, and which was awesome and, and totally understandable. And so our committee um, met for the first time on April 13th. And um, we spent some time getting to know one another, right, in that smaller group. And I am really thrilled to say um, and share that we have 
um, a great depth of uh, both, both professional expertise, experience, and a lot of passion and commitment to this work, right? Um, and, and so it was good for us to get to know one another. Um, we spent some time reviewing um, the housekeeping open meeting laws just as a level set and a reminder of how we conduct business, you know, the recording of our notes as well as the recording of the meeting itself. And then we moved into the charge of the subcommittee, which by way of review is data policies, statutes, regulations will be reviewed to eliminate barriers and gaps and inequities in home ownership, business development and employment. And um, as you all know, how important it is to always keep, as you said, Secretary Krim, the goal ahead of us, right? This is what we're here to do. There's a lot of work and a lot of you know, different avenues, but this is our charge. So we, we agreed as a subcommittee that there's a lot of data that's already out there. We, we've seen it both within state government and then beyond, which is where um, the expertise of the full subcommittee comes into play. Uh, and then we discussed the fact that our question then becomes, how do we narrow the focus? You know, home ownership, business development and employment are big areas. And, and then how do we find the path forward? Uh, the reminder, once again, that our focus goes beyond state government operations, although obviously we're going to um, leverage that information. And so we decided uh, that we wanna take a look at, as I said, not only state government data, but also the data that um, is out in the general public, so to speak, especially as it relates to our individual areas of expertise. And that what we want to do is uh, start with the data, see where that leads us. And then we want to focus as a subcommittee by starting on one of those three areas, right? Recognizing that we have um, a limited time frame, right? And that we want to accomplish as much as we can um, once again, with measurable goals and outcomes. So um, what we will be doing as we take our next steps as a subcommittee is to start with the data, get a lay of the land. Um, and when we do that, identify those policy barriers and potential solutions. Um, we've already scheduled our next two meetings, which will be on July, excuse me, June 2nd, and then on uh, July 9th, that we, we recognize that this is a heavy lift and we need to be doing the work at the quote unquote ground level on a monthly basis in between our um, full council meetings. Uh, let's see. And then in terms of our action items, once again, gathering um, information from other agencies, but then taking a look at where are we now? Where are we looking to go? Um, what gaps does the data show us? What strategies do we want to pursue to address those gaps? What policy barriers do we identify and what policy recommendations would we advance? So I'm really appreciative of that presentation we had around policy stages and what does that look like? That was um, excellent. Uh, just in general, right? From an information standpoint, but in particular um, relevant to our subcommittee. So I, unless there are some questions, I don't have anything else to uh, report out. Great. Thank you very much. That was an excellent overview of that first meeting and just kind of how your subcommittee will be synthesizing the information that uh, you will be receiving and how you're thinking about prioritizing. Remember, we, we have time. Our first year is to set uh, those goals. We're as big as some of these uh, focus areas are, we're not going to bite everything off in that first year. It's a staged approach. And so I appreciate the way you've laid things out and the expectation around uh, the work and the meeting outside of the quarterly council meeting. And so next up, we'll have Dr. LeVar Charleston talk about his subcommittee, the Economic and Business Development Subcommittee. Thank you, Secretary Krim. Um, to, to Governor Evers, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, uh, Secretary Krim, the rest of the cabinet secretaries, Vice Chair Zong, 
council members and all, uh, thank you uh, all for this opportunity and, and, and thank you for your dedication, um, commitment and, and unyielding service to this great state of Wisconsin. Uh, my name is LeVar Charleston, as the secretary mentioned, and I have the pleasure of uh, serving as chair of the Economic and Business Development Subcommittee. Um, we have a phenomenal group of, of eight subcommittee members. And, and while sub, several of us have uh, collaborated with each other uh, previously in different roles, this composition uh, is, is novel for this particular group. Um, as such, we sought to, to really connect with one another in the short, ter in the short time that we had together to understand our why for serving in this capacity and to capture our shared sense of value um, and commitment of and uh, of this work of and to this work uh, the consensus is that this subcommittee has a deep and lasting interest and concern about equity and inclusion as it relates to wisconsin businesses uh, procurement uh, entrepreneurship and economic development particularly among our minority and women citizens we know that we have a limited amount of time to develop a, a product, an artifact, a plan, if you will, that could minimally serve as a roadmap to more equitable and inclusive working and even learning uh, environments and conditions so that we are continually working to remove the barriers to business ownership and economic development, particularly for those uh, in the state who have been historically uh, ostracized or excluded to these enterprises here in our great state. So our charge is to identify and implement uh, systemic strategies that will increase the utilization of marginalized groups and women-owned businesses through state contracting and other support mechanisms. And, and we know that we have a, a two-year time frame for our work that we indeed hope and expect to outlast our two-year appointment in this role. Um, and hearing Dr. Davis's presentation today, we look forward to connecting with her and her team as it relates to our efforts as well. We discussed in our initial meeting um, our top priorities and know that the, the common things related to our priorities are housing equity, wealth creation, uh, three, economic mobility, and four, education. And as such, we discuss expectations and responsibilities and, and really what I call brain wrestle around a bit around what our goals could and should be in an effort to realize uh, our priorities. Um, and working on our goals and in the spirit of collaboration, we determined that there are three buckets essentially in, in, in relation to our goals that would assist us in solidifying our goals for our time together. Uh, we call them the three Bs and some they are uh, barriers. What are the barriers to entrepreneurship, state contracting and access to support mechanisms that uh, would move women and minority owned businesses forward? Uh, best practices, what are the best practices for economic and business development for women and minorities in the state? And then big ideas. Uh, what are the innovative or big ideas? What is what is it that we could do that perhaps no one else is doing or that we could innovate to make our own here in the state of Wisconsin based on uh, 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 our culture and understanding us, right? So we know that there's money being spent every year by the federal and state government and that there's a great deal of subcontracting going on. How much of those allocations are being spent on women and minority owned businesses? Um, essentially those communities that would help us to move the equity, diversity, and inclusion agenda forward. So um, we began the process of thinking about our short-term goals, thinking about more robust minority-owned business engagement into the procurement process, working through how some of this work can be informed by policy and even civil rights measures, measures, measures <laughs> civil rights measures, um, and then educating ourselves in the broader state around procurement and contracting processes. A lot of this, again, Director Davis had mentioned, so we can't wait to connect with her as we continue our work. Um, you know, even thinking about the value we have right here in our own subcommittee and the different positions that people hold. So long term, we're thinking about, you know, making the procurement process more visible and making that process work for minority owned businesses and communities, thinking about how marketplace vendors and businesses could, uh, could and perhaps should have a dedicate uh, dedication to working with minoritized populations, and even the idea of enhancing community education programming so that minority owned businesses could wholly understand the process. Again, some things that Director Davis alluded to. Um, so these are just a few things that we're wrestling with uh, right through now, and we're excited about uh, getting to work on these items. We're in the process of scheduling our uh, meetings for the rest of, for the duration of the year, um, as all of our subcommittee members are extremely busy. So we uh, we are looking to solidify that very, very, uh, in, in short order. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for that overview of the Economic Development Subcommittee. 
And I appreciate the three Bs. They're right here stuck in my head now. Barriers, best practices, and big ideas. And so we really look forward to uh, having a chance to hear more about the work that you all will be doing. And then our third subcommittee, the Community Engagement Committee, that is led by Secretary Kolar, she'll give us an update of their subcommittee work. Well, thank you, Secretary Krim, and thank you for the opportunity to chair the Community Engagement Subcommittee. Nine of our 10 members of the subcommittee were able to meet virtually on April 30th. We began the meeting with each member providing a brief background about themselves, and then sharing what most excited members about this subcommittee. This very motivated and enthusiastic group of people shared their views of the connections with the groups they represent and how the depth and breadth of Wisconsin's diversity can be recognized and celebrated throughout our state. Members are passionate and ready for action to build greater partnerships and increase community engagement. To provide structure to this subcommittee and potential meetings of our members, we, like others, briefly reviewed open meeting law requirements. We also reviewed the subcommittee's charge to create and sustain an environment that regularly scans for, recognizes, and celebrates diversity, equitable and inclusive practices and initiatives, community and state cultural events, significant activities and efforts. We next brainstormed how the subcommittee will meet this charge. Ideas included developing a state repository that includes cultural events throughout the state. Members asked what funding might be available to achieve the subcommittee goals. Current support by Governor Evers and Lieutenant Governor Barnes through cultural awareness and celebrations was noted. Yet we need to seek additional opportunities to educate and bring awareness of cultures and experiences. This includes religion and faith as part of a diversity of cultures. The subcommittee dialogue was enlightening and motivating. Before concluding our meeting, we were reminded by a member that not everyone will be supportive of our efforts. And we certainly have learned that or it's been reinforced through the budgeting effort. Yet there was recognition that some will misinterpret our efforts and use our recommendations to further a cultural divide. This was a good reality check, but we will persist and look forward to making a positive difference in Wisconsin. That concludes my report of the Cultural Engagement Subcommittee, Secretary Krim. Great, thank you very much, Secretary Kolar. And I appreciate the way your subcommittee really talked about the depth and the breadth and the need for a repository, but also reminding us that everybody isn't as gung-ho about uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion work that we are, but we as a collective will do this work and move it forward knowing that we have full support of the leader of the state and that we are moving his agenda forward. So I appreciate that um, reminder from your subcommittee and really look forward to the good work that you'll do alongside the other subcommittees. And so what the council has heard is an enthusiasm, a why we're doing this work, but yet again, the acknowledgement of the expertise that is among the 31 members of this council. And with that expertise, we'll work together to do uh, very fine work. So I really look forward to the sustainable action plans that we'll put together as a council. We have a few minutes uh, before I go into our wrap-up remarks to see if there are questions uh, that people have of myself, of my Zong as the vice chair, or any of our three subcommittee leads. Questions? There was one question regarding the subcommittee notes. And yes, we will make the subcommittee notes available to all of the council members. Great. 
Any other questions? Currently there are no hands raised or no notes or questions in the chat, Secretary. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you could advance the next slide, I will um, move our focus to our future meetings. And so our next full council meeting will be Friday, August 13th. Please save that date on your calendars for Friday, August 13th. And then the following meeting, which would be the fourth meeting um, of the council would be Friday, November 12th, same time. And so the subcommittee leads actually listed, um, talked about some of their upcoming meetings for people to make note, but also you will be hearing directly from your subcommittee lead on um, when your next committee meeting is. And I always have told everybody on the council, I remain available to everyone via email or phone. So feel free to reach out to me directly if I can be of assistance or if you have questions throughout. Um, looking at our future meeting, um, we will actually continue with our continue, uh, excuse me, with our cabinet agency reports. We have four additional cabinet agencies that will report out to the council, much in the same fashion that we reported, that we heard from our four areas today. And we believe this first part of this early council work is about capacity building, how to state government work, what is happening at the agencies. What you will notice at our next meeting is more of a shift moving toward more subcommittee work and uh, reporting out on what we're doing there, as well as how we will navigate information um, needed to inform the work of the subcommittees, sort of that roadmap. How do we get information to you that you need to begin to better formulate those action plans? We will lay that roadmap out as well. And so I'm excited about what we have accomplished to date. I'm, ex I'm excited about the support and the resources that we have uh, in place and the resources that we will have moving forward. And I'm most excited about the continued enthusiasm and focus and energy that everyone on the council is bringing to the work that we have in front of us. And so with that, I'll say we are- Hey, Secretary Chesney, Madam Secretary. Oh, yep, I will okay. let y'all jump in. I was going to hand it over to Laris or Malika to see if there were other items that maybe I missed or we should go over. Malika? Yes, I just wanted to ask. I know that um, I was trying to find my little hand raiser thing and I can't find it. So I apologize when you were asking about questions and just wanted to add. I know that we said that we were going to continue the agency overviews and EI updates by the agency on the next meeting. And just wondering from the council, if there are other agenda items you would like us to add for consideration. Going once. Um, we are asking, and someone is asking us to remove the PowerPoint so a screenshot can be taken. Are you okay with that, Madam Chair? I am okay with that. Okay. Can you pull down the PowerPoint? See if we can put it in gallery view. There you go. And so just a reminder, the agency updates that you'll have at the next meeting will be Secretary uh, Carr from the Department of Corrections, myself from the Department of Safety and Professional Services, Joaquin from uh, WIDA, and the fourth one, Amy Pachakic <laughs> from DWD.
All right. I know that was a lot of information in the meeting. Remember, you'll have the you have the PowerPoints, but you also have the additional handouts regarding how government works and other re uh, reference materials. And again, if there are other materials that you're needing between now and your meeting or your subcommittee subcommittee meeting, feel free to reach out to any of us and we will get you the necessary information. And so with that, I see Mai has her hand raised. Mai. Thank you. Um, I know that you had sent out the dates for the, quarter, the quarterly meeting. Um, do you know with the new CDC, with the, with the Mass, if we're still meeting on, on a virtual, or if this is tentatively an in-person, it would just help me with family responsibilities. Yep, and thank you for asking that question. We will definitely meet virtually for the next meeting, we want to allow the um, CDC requirements to settle down and we want to continue to uh, evaluate um, our communities and the safety of meetings, as well as uh, be mindful of travel plans and family plans that may need to be made. And so we will give plenty of leeway um, for people regarding meeting in person. But for now, we will move forward with virtual meetings. And I anticipate maintaining a virtual component no matter what. Um, as I mentioned, we have over 100 committees, boards, and councils at the Department of Safety and Professional Services, and we always maintain a virtual option for people because we realize um, things come up and we want to be able that the, no people to know that the meetings are accessible to them in whatever manner they need them. Much. You're welcome. All right. Well, with that, I want to thank everybody for their participation, their input, um, and their enthusiasm, and all the congratulations for me in completing my doctorate. Thank you all so much. I feel like I'm joining many of you. Um, but with that, this has been a great meeting, lots of good work happening, and lots of good energy. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for your participation on the council and your continued good work in your own communities in the work that you're doing every day. Bye-bye. You all have a great day.